This is Chapter One and Two of the Sincere Huron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sincere Huron or La Ingenue by Voltaire, translated by Francis Ashmore. Chapter One. One day, Saint Dunstan an Irishman by nation, and a saint by trade, quitted Ireland, riding on a small mountain which took its course towards the coast of France, and set his saintship down in the bay of St. Malo. As soon as he had alighted, he gave his blessing to the mountain, which, after some profound bows, politely took its leave and returned to its former situation. On this spot St. Dunstan laid the foundation of a small priory and gave it the name of Priory Mountain, which it still retains, as every one knows. In the year 1689, on the fifteenth day of July, in the evening, the abbot Kirkabon, prior of Our Lady of the Mountain, happened to take the air along the shore with his sister. The prior, now a little declined in age, was a very good pastor, greatly beloved of his neighbors, as he had formerly been of their wives. What added most to the respect paid him was, that among all his clerical neighbors he only could walk to bed after supper. He was tolerably read in theology, and when weary of reading St. Augustine, he refreshed himself with Rabelais, so that all the world spoke well of him. Mademoiselle Kirkabon, who had never been married notwithstanding her hearty wishes to be so, had preserved a freshness of complexion in her forty-fifth year. Her character was that of a good and sensible woman. She was fond of pleasure, and was a devotee. As they walked, the prior, looking on the sea, said to his sister, It is here, alas, that our poor brother embarked with our dear sister-in-law, Madame Kirkabon, his wife, on board the Swallow frigate twenty years ago, to serve the king in Canada. Had he not been killed, we might probably see him again. Do you believe? says Mademoiselle Kirkabon, that our sister-in-law was eaten by the Cherokees, as we have been told? Certain it is. Had they not eaten her, she would have come back. I shall grieve for her all my life. She was a charming woman, and our brother, who had a great deal of understanding, would no doubt have obtained a large fortune. They were thus expressing themselves, with mutual tenderness, when they perceived a small ship enter the bay of rents with the tide. The vessel was from England, and came to sell provisions. The crew instantly leaped on shore, without taking any notice of the prior, or Mademoiselle, his sister, who were both shocked at the little attention shown them. Not such was the behavior of a well-formed youth, who, darting himself over the heads of his companions, stood suddenly before Mademoiselle Kirkabon, unaccustomed to bowing he made her a sign with his head. His figure and his dress attracted the notice of brother and sister. His head was uncovered, and his legs were bare. Instead of shoes, he wore a kind of sandal. His long hair flowed in tresses from his head. A small, close doublet displayed the symmetry of his shape, and he had a sweet martial air. He held in one hand a small bottle of Barbados water and in the other a bag which contained a goblet and some sea-biscuit. He spoke French very intelligibly, and offered some of his Barbados water to Mademoiselle Kirkabon and her brother. He drank with them. He made them drink a second time, and all with an air of such native simplicity as charmed them quite. They offered him their service, and asked him who he was, and whither he was going. The young man answered that he knew not where he should go, that he had some curiosity, and that he had a desire to see the coast of France, that once he had seen it, he should return. The prior, judging by his accent that he was not an Englishman, took the liberty of asking what countryman he was. I am a Huron, answered the youth. Mademoiselle Kirkabon, amazed and enchanted to see a Huron, who had behaved so politely to her, begged the young man's company to supper. He complied immediately and all three went together to the priory of Our Lady of the Mountain. The short and round mademoiselle devoured him with her little eyes, and kept saying to her brother, 
this tall lad has a complexion of lilies and roses what a fine skin he has for a huron very true sister says the prior she put a hundred questions one after the other and the traveller answered them all very pertinently the report was soon spread that they had a huron at the priory and all the genteel company of the country came to supper the abbot of st ives came with mademoiselle his sister a fine handsome well-educated girl the bailiff the tax-gatherer and their wives came all together the foreigner was seated between mademoiselle kirkabon and mademoiselle st ives the company eyed him with admiration they all questioned him together they did not confound the huron but at length wearied with so much noise he told them in a sweet but serious tone gentlemen in my country one talks after another how can i answer you if you will not allow me to hear you reason brings people to a momentary reflection they were all silent monsieur bailiff who always made the most of a foreigner wherever he found him and who was the most famous man for asking questions in the province opening a mouth half a foot wide began sir what is your name i have always been called the sincere answered the huron and the english have confirmed that name because i always speak as i think and act as i like but being born a huron how did you get to england i was carried thither being made prisoner by the english after some resistance the english who love brave people because they are brave and as honest as we proposed my either returning to my family or going with them to england i accepted the latter having natural inclination for travelling but sir says the bailiff with his usual gravity how could you think of abandoning your father and mother i never knew either father or mother says the foreigner this affected the company they all repeated neither father nor mother we will supply their place says the mistress of the house to her brother the prior how interesting is the character of this huron gentleman he thanked her with a noble and proud cordiality but gave her to understand that he wanted not the assistance of any one i perceive mr huron said the huge bailiff that you talk better french than can be expected from an indian a frenchman he answered whom they had made prisoner when i was a boy and with whom i contracted a great friendship instructed me i presently learn what i have an inclination to learn when i came to plymouth i met one of those french refugees whom you i know not why call huguenots he improved my knowledge of your language and as soon as i could express myself intelligibly i came to see your country because i like the french well enough when they do not ask too many questions notwithstanding this slight hint the abbe of st ives asked him which of the three languages pleased him the best the huron the english or the french the huron to be sure he answered is it possible cries mademoiselle kirkabon i always thought french was the first language after that of lower brittany then all were eager to know how in huron they asked for snuff he replied taille what signifies to eat essenton mademoiselle kirkabon was impatient to know how they called to make love he informed her provender and insisted not without reason that these words were well worth their synonyms in french and english provender especially seemed very pretty to the whole company the prior who laid in his library a huron grammar which had been given him by the reverend father segar thedat a recollect and famous missionary rose from the table to consult it he returned quite panting with tenderness and joy and acknowledged the foreigner for a true huron the company speculated a little on the multiplicity of languages and all agreed that had it not been to the, for the affair of the tower of babel the whole world would have spoken french the inquisitive bailiff who till now had entertained some suspicions of the foreigner conceived a, the deepest respect for him he spoke to him with more civility than before but the huron took no notice of it mademoiselle st ives was very curious to know how the hurons made love by performing great actions to please objects which resembled you all the company 
admired and applauded, Mademoiselle St. Ives blushed, and was extremely well pleased. Mademoiselle Kirkabon blushed likewise, but was not so well pleased. She was a little piqued that this gallantry was not addressed to her. But she was a good-natured woman, and her affection for the Huron was not at all diminished. She asked him, with great complacency, how many mistresses he had at home. Only one, answered the foreigner, Miss Abakaba, the good friend of my dear nurse. The reed is not more straight, the ermine is not more white, no lamb is meeker, no eagle is fiercer, nor any stag swifter than was my Abakaba. One day she pursued a hare not above fifty leagues from my habitation, a base Algonquin, who dwells a hundred leagues further, took the hare from her. I was told of it. I ran thither, and one stroke of my club leveled him to the ground. I brought him to the feet of my mistress bound hand and foot. Abacaba's parents were for eating him, but I always had a disrelish for such kind of dishes. I therefore set him at liberty, and made him my friend. Abacaba was so pleased with my conduct, that she preferred me to all her lovers. Alas, how she would have continued to love me, had she not been devoured by a bear. I slew the bear, and for a long time wore his hide. But that has not consoled me. Mademoiselle St. Ives felt a secret pleasure at hearing that Abacaba had been his only mistress, and that she was no more. Yet she understood not the cause of her own pleasure. Every eye was riveted on the Huron, and he was highly applauded by the whole company for delivering an Algonquin from the spits of his countrymen. The inconsiderate bailiff was now grown so violent that he even proceeded to ask the Huron what religion he was of, whether he had chosen the English, the French, or that of the Huguenots. I am of my own religion, said he, just as you are of yours. Lord, cried Mademoiselle Kirkabon, I see already that the profane English have not once thought of baptizing him. Good God, said Mademoiselle St. Ives, how is it possible that the Hurons should not be Roman Catholics? Have not those reverend fathers, the Jesuits, converted all the world? The Huron assured her that in his country nobody was converted, that no true American ever changed his opinion, and that there was not in their language a word to express inconstancy. These last words extremely pleased Mademoiselle St. Ives. Oh, we'll baptize him, we'll baptize him, said Miss Kirkabon to the prior. You shall have the honor, my dear brother, and I will be his godmother. The abbot of St. Ives shall present him at the font. It will make a fine appearance. It will be talked of all over Brittany, and will do us great honor. The company were all of the same mind with the mistress of the house. They all cried, We'll baptize him. The Huron interrupted them by saying that in England every one was allowed to live as he pleased. He rather showed some aversion to the proposal which was made, and could not help telling them that the laws of the Huron were full as good as those of Lower Brittany. He finished with saying that he should return the next day. The bottles grew empty, and the company went to bed. After the Huron had been conducted to his room, Mademoiselle Kirkabon and her friend, Mademoiselle St. Ives, could not help peeping through the keyhole to see how a Huron went to bed. They saw that he spread the blankets on the floor, and laid himself upon them with the finest attitude in the world. Chapter 2. The Huron called the ingenue, acknowledged by his relations. The ingenue, according to custom, awoke with the sun, and at the crowing of the cock, which is called in England and Hurania the trumpet of the day, he did not imitate what is styled good company, who languish in the bed of indolence till the sun has performed half his daily career, unable to sleep, but not disposed to rise, and lose so many precious hours in that doubtful state between life and death, and who nevertheless complain that life is too short. He had already traversed two or three leagues, and killed fifteen brace of game with shot only, when, upon his return, he found the prior of Our Lady of the Mountain, 
and his discreet sister walking in their nightcaps in their little garden. He presented them with the spoils of his morning labor, and taking from his bosom a kind of little talisman which he constantly wore about his neck, he entreated them to accept it as an acknowledgment of their kind reception they had given him. It is, he said, the most valuable thing I am possessed of. I have been assured that I shall always be happy whilst I carry this little toy about me, and I give it to you that you may always be happy. The prior, and Mademoiselle smiled with pity at the frankness of the ingenue. This present consisted of two little portraits, very ill done, tied together with a greasy piece of string. Mademoiselle Kirkabon asked him if there were any painters in Huronia. No, replied the ingenue. I had this curiosity from my nurse. Her husband had obtained it by conquest in stripping some of the French of Canada who had made war upon us. This is all I know of the matter. The prior looked attentively upon these pictures, whilst he changed color. His hands trembled, and he seemed much affected. By Our Lady of the Mountain, he cried out, I believe these to be the faces of the captain, my brother, and his lady. Mademoiselle, after viewing them with the same emotion, thought likewise. They were both struck with astonishment and joy blended with grief. They were melted. They both wept. Their hearts throbbed, and during their disorder the pictures were interchanged between them at least twenty times in a second. They seemed to devour the Hurons' pictures with their eyes. They ask one after another, and even both at once, at what time and in what place, how these miniatures fell into the hands of his nurse. They reckoned and computed the time from the captain's departure. They recollected having received advice that he had penetrated as far as the country of the Hurons, and from that time they had never heard anything more of him. The Huron had told them that he had never known either father or mother. The prior, who is a man of sense, observed that he had a little beard, and he knew very well that Hurons never had any. His chin was somewhat hairy, and he was therefore the son of a European. My brother and sister-in-law were never seen after the expedition against the Hurons in 1669. My nephew must have been sucking at the breast. The Huron nurse has preserved his life and been a mother to him. At length, after a hundred questions and answers, the prior and his sister concluded that the Huron was their own nephew. They embraced him, whilst tears streamed from their eyes, and the Huron laughed to think that an Indian should be the nephew to a prior in Lower Brittany. All the company went downstairs. Monsieur de St. Ives, who is a great physiognomist, compared the two pictures with the Huron's countenance. They observed, very skilfully, that he had the mother's eyes, the forehead and nose of the late Captain Kirkabon, and the cheeks common to both. Mademoiselle St. Ives, who had never seen either father or mother, was strenuously of the opinion that the young man had a perfect resemblance of them. They all admired the providence and the interconnectedness of the events of this world. In a word, they were so persuaded, so convinced, the birth of the Huron, that he himself consented to be the prior's nephew, saying that he would as soon have him for his uncle as another. He went to return thanks in the church of Our Lady of the Mountain, whilst the Huron, with an air of indifference, amused himself with drinking in the house. The English, who had brought him over, and who were ready to set sail, came to tell him that it was time to depart. Probably, said he to them, you have not met with any of your uncles or aunts. I shall stay here. Go you back to Plymouth. I give you all my clothes, as I no longer have any occasion f for things of this world, since I am the nephew of a prior. The English set sail without being at all concerned whether the Huron had any relations or not in Lower Brittany. After the uncles, the aunt, and the company had sung Te Deum, after the bailiff had once more overwhelmed the Huron with questions, after they had exhausted all their astonishment, joy, and tenderness, the prior of the mountain and the abbey St. Ives concluded that the Huron should be baptized with all possible expedition. But the case was very different for the tall, robust Indian of twenty-two than an infant 
who is regenerated without his knowing anything of the matter. It was necessary to instruct him, and this appeared difficult, for the Abbe St. Ives supposed that a man who was not born in France could not be endowed with common sense. The prior indeed observed to the company that though, in fact, the ingenuous gentleman, his nephew, was not so fortunate as to be born in Lower Brittany, he was not upon that account any way deficient in sense, which might be concluded from all his answers, and that doubtless nature had greatly favoured him, as well on his father as on his mother's side. He was then asked if he had ever read any book. He said he had read Rabelais, translated into English, and some passages in Shakespeare, which he knew by heart, that these books belonged to the captain on board whose ship he came from America to Plymouth, and that he was very well pleased with them. The bailiff failed not, putting many questions to him concerning these books. I acknowledge, said the Huron, I thought I understood some things, but not the whole. The Abbe of St. Ives reflected upon this discourse, that it was in this manner that he had always read, and that most men read no other way. Have you, said he to the Huron, doubtless read the Bible? Never, Monsieur Abbe. It was not among the captain's books. I have never heard it mentioned. This is the way of those cursed English, said Mademoiselle Kirkabon. They mind more a piece of Shakespeare's, a plum pudding, or a bottle of rum, than they do the Pentateuch. For this reason they have never converted any Indian in America. They are certainly cursed by God and we shall conquer Jamaica and Virginia from them in a very short time. Be this as it may, the most skilful tailor in all St. Malo was sent for, to dress the Huron from head to foot. The company separated, and the bailiff went elsewhere to display his inquisitiveness. Mademoiselle St. Ives, in parting, returned several times to observe the young stranger, and made him lower curtsies than ever she did any one in her whole life. The bailiff, before he took his leave, presented Mademoiselle St. Ives with a stupid dolt of a son, just come from college, but she scarce looked at him, so much was she taken up with the politeness of the Huron. This is the end of chapters 1 and 2 of The Sincere Huron by Voltaire. Chapters 3 through 7 of The Sincere Huron or L'Ingenue. This is a LibriVox recording in the public domain. This recording by Roy Schreiber. Chapter 3 The Huron Converted. The prior, finding that he was somewhat advanced in years, and that God had sent him a nephew for his consolation, took it into his head that he would resign his benefit in his favor if he succeeded in baptizing him, and of making him enter into orders. The Huron had an excellent memory. The firmness of the organs of Lower Brittany, strengthened by the climate of Canada, had made his head so vigorous that when he was struck upon it, he scarce felt it, and when anything was graven in it, nothing could efface it. Nothing had ever escaped his memory. His conception was the more sure and lively, by reason that his infancy had not been loaded with useless fooleries which overwhelm ours. Things entered into his head without being clouded. The prior at length resolved to make him read the New Testament. The Huron devoured it with great pleasure, but not knowing at what time, or in what country, all the adventures related in this book had happened, he did not in the least doubt that the scene of the action had been Lower Brittany, and he swore that he would cut off Cephas's and Pontius Pilate's ears if he ever met those scoundrels. His uncle, charmed with these good dispositions, soon brought him to the point. He applauded his zeal, but at the same time acquainted him that it was needless, as these people had been dead upwards of sixteen hundred and ninety years. The Hurons soon got the whole book by heart. He sometimes proposed difficulties that greatly embarrassed the prior. He was often obliged to consult the Abbe St. Ives, who, not knowing what to answer, brought a Jesuit of Lower Brittany to perfect the conversion of the Huron. Grace at length operated, and the Huron promised to become a Christian. He did not doubt but that the first step to
toward it was circumcision for said he i do not find in the book that was put into my hands a single person who was not circumcised it is therefore evident that i must make a sacrifice of my foreskin and the sooner the better he sent for the surgeon of the village and desired him to perform the operation thinking thereby greatly to rejoice mademoiselle kirkabon and all the company when the thing was once done the surgeon who had never performed such an operation acquainted the family who screamed out the good kirkabon trembled lest her nephew whom she knew to be resolute and expeditious should perform the operation unskilfully himself and that fatal consequences should ensue in which the ladies through the goodness of their hearts are always concerned the prior rectified the huron's mistake representing to him that circumcision was no longer in fashion that baptism was much more gentle and salutary that the law of grace was not like the law of rigor the huron who had much good sense and was well disposed disputed but soon acknowledged his error which seldom happens in europe among disputants in a word he promised to let himself be baptized whenever they pleased it was necessary that he should go previously to confession and this was the greatest difficulty to surmount the huron had constantly in his pocket the book his uncle had given him he did not find there that a single apostle had ever been confessed and this made him very restive the prior silenced him by showing him in the epistle of st james the minor these words confess your sins to one another the huron was mute and confessed his sins to a recollet when he had done he dragged the recollet from the confessional chair seizing him with a vigorous arm placed himself in his seat making the recollet kneel before him come my friend it is said we must confess our sins to one another i have related my sins to you you shall not stir until you recount yours whilst he said this he fixed his great knee against his adversary's stomach the recollect roared and groaned till he made the church echo the noise brought people to his assistance who found the catechumen cuffing the monk in the name of st james the minor the joy at baptizing at once a lower breton a huron and an englishman surmounted all these singularities there were even some theologians of the opinion that confession was not necessary as baptism supplied the place of everything the bishop of st malo was chosen for the ceremony who flattered as may be believed at baptizing a huron arrived in a pompous equipage followed by his clergy mademoiselle st ives put on her best gown to bless god and sent for a hairdresser from st malo to shine at the ceremony the inquisitive bailiff brought the whole country with him the church was magnificently ornamented but when the huron was summoned to attend the baptismal font he was not to be found his uncle and aunt sought for him everywhere it was imagined he was gone a-hunting according to his usual custom every one convened to the festival searched the neighboring woods and villages but no intelligence could be obtained of the huron they began to fear he was returned to england some remembered that he had said he was very fond of that country the prior and his sister were persuaded that nobody was baptized there and were troubled for their nephew's soul the bishop was confounded and ready to return home the prior and the abbe of st ives were in despair the bailiff interrogated all passengers with his usual gravity mademoiselle kirkabon melted into tears mademoiselle st ives did not weep but she vented such deep sighs as seemed to testify to her sacramental disposition they were walking in this melancholy mood among the willows and the reeds upon the banks of the little river rents when they perceived in the middle of the stream a large figure tolerably white with its two arms across its breast they screamed out and ran away but curiosity being stronger than any other consideration they slipped softly among the reeds and when they were pretty certain they could not be seen they were willing to decry what it was chapter four the huron baptized the prior and the abbe having run to the riverside they asked the huron what he was doing in faith said he gentlemen i am waiting to be baptized i have been an hour in the water up to my neck and i do not think it civil to let me be quite spent 
my dear nephew said the prior to him tenderly this is not the way of being baptized in lower brittany put on your clothes and come with us mademoiselle st ives listening to the discourse said in a whisper to her companion mademoiselle do you think he will put on his clothes in such a hurry the huron however replied to the prior you will not make me believe now as you did before i have studied very well since and i am very certain that there is no other kind of baptism the eunuch of queen candace was baptized in a rivulet i defy you to show me in the book you gave me that people were ever baptized any other way i either will not be baptized at all or the ceremony shall be performed in the river it was in vain to remonstrate to him that customs altered he was headstrong for he was both a breton and a huron he always returned to the eunuch of queen candace and though mademoiselle and his aunt who had observed him through the willows were authorized to tell him that he had no right to quote such a man they nevertheless said nothing so great was their discretion the bishop came himself to speak to him which was a great thing but he could not prevail the huron disputed him show me said he in the book my uncle gave me one single man that was baptized in a river and i will do whatever you please his aunt in despair had observed the first time her nephew bowed he made a much lower, lower bow to mademoiselle st ives than to any one in the company that he had not even saluted the bishop with so much respect blended with cordiality as he did that agreeable young lady she thought it advisable to apply to her in this great embarrassment she entreated her to use her influence to engage the huron to be baptized according to the custom of brittany thinking that her nephew could never be a christian if he persisted in being christened in a stream mademoiselle st ives blushed at the secret pleasure she felt in being appointed to execute so important a commission she modestly approached the huron and squeezing his hand in quite a noble manner she said to him what would you do nothing to please me and in uttering these words she raised her eyes from a downcast look into a grateful tenderness oh yes mademoiselle everything you require all that you command whether it is to be baptized in water fire or blood there is nothing i can refuse you mademoiselle st ives had the glory of effecting in two words what neither the importunities of the prior the repeated interrogations of the bailiff or the reasoning of the bishop could effect she was sensible of her triumph but she was not yet sensible of its utmost latitude baptism was administered and received with all decency magnificence and propriety possible his uncle and aunt yielded to the abbe st ives and his sister the favor of supporting the huron upon the font mademoiselle st ives eyes sparkled with joy at being a godmother she was ignorant of the full extent to which this high title subjected her she accepted the honor without being acquainted with its fatal consequences as there never was any ceremony that was not followed by a good dinner the company took their seats at table after the christening the humorists of lower brittany said they did not choose to have their wine baptized the prior said that wine according to solomon cherished the heart of man the bishop added that the patriarch judea ought to have tied his ass colt to the wine and steeped his cloak in the blood of the grape and that he was sorry the same could not be done in lower brittany to which god had not allotted vines every one endeavored to say a good thing upon the huron's christening and strokes of gallantry to the godmother the bailiff ever interrogating asked the huron if he was faithful in keeping his promises how said he can i fail to keep them since i have deposited them in the hands of mademoiselle st ive the huron grew warm he had drank plentifully to his godmother's health if said he i had been baptized with your hand i feel that the water which was poured upon the nape of my neck would have burnt me the bailiff thought this was too poetical being ignorant that allegory is a familiar figure in canada but his godmother was very well pleased the huron had at his baptism received the name of hercules 
the bishop of st marlow frequently inquired who was this titular saint whom he had never heard mentioned before the jesuit who was a very learned man told him that he was a saint who had wrought twelve miracles there was a thirteenth which was well worth the other twelve but it was not proper for a jesuit to mention it it was the transforming of fifty girls into women in one night's time a wag who is present related this miracle very feelingly the ladies all cast down their eyes and judged from the physiognomy of the huron that he was worthy of the saint whose name he bore chapter five the huron in love it must be acknowledged that from the time of this christening and this dinner mademoiselle st ives passionately wished that the bishop would make her again an assistant with m hercules in some other fine ceremony however as she was well brought up and very modest she did not dare entirely agree with herself in regard to these tender sentiments but if a look a word a gesture a thought escaped from her she concealed it admirably well under the veil of modesty she was tender lively and sagacious as soon as the bishop was gone the huron and mademoiselle st ives met together without thinking they were in search of one another they spoke together without premeditating what they said the sincere youth immediately declared that he loved her with all his heart and that the beauteous abakeba with whom he had been desperately in love in his own country was far inferior to her mademoiselle replied with her usual modesty that the prior her uncle and the lady her aunt should be spoken to immediately and that on her side she would say a few words to her dear brother the abbe of st ives and that she flattered herself that it would meet with no opposition the youth replied that the consent of any one was entirely superfluous that it appeared to him extremely ridiculous to go and ask others what they were to do that when two parties were agreed there was no occasion for a third to accomplish their union i never consult with any one said he when i have a mind to breakfast to hunt or to sleep i am sensible that in love it is not amiss to have the consent of the person whom we wish for but as i am neither in love with my uncle nor my aunt i have no occasion to address myself to them in this affair and if you will believe me you may equally dispense with the advice of the abbe st ives it may be supposed that the young lady exerted all the delicacy of her wit to bring the huron to the terms of good breeding she was even angry but soon softened in a word it cannot be said how the conversation would have ended if the declining day had not brought the abbe to conduct his sister home the huron left his uncle and aunt to rest being somewhat fatigued with the ceremony and their long dinner he passed part of the night in writing verses in the huron language upon his well-beloved for it should be known there is no country where love has not rendered lovers poets the next day his uncle spoke to him in the following manner after breakfast in the presence of mademoiselle kirkabon who was quite melted at the discourse heaven be praised that you have the honour my dear nephew to be a christian of lower brittany but this is not enough i am somewhat advanced in years my brother has left only a little bit of ground which is a very small matter i have a good priory if you will only make yourself sub-deacon, as I hope you will, I will resign my priory in your favor, and you will live quite at your ease after having been the consolation of my old age. The Huron replied, Uncle, much may be due you. Live as long as you can. I do not know what it is to be a sub or what it is to resign, but everything will be agreeable to me, provided I have Mademoiselle St. Ives at my disposal good god nephew what is it you say you love that beautiful young lady to distraction yes uncle alas nephew it is impossible you should ever marry her it is very possible uncle for she not only squeezed my hand when she left me but she promised she would ask me in marriage i certainly shall wed her it is impossible i tell you she is your godmother it is a dreadful sin for a godmother to give her hand to her god's son it is contrary to all laws human and divine why the deuce uncle should it be forbidden to marry one's godmother when she is young and handsome 
I do not find in the book you gave me that it was wrong to marry young women who assisted in christenings. I perceive every day that an infinite number of things are done here which are not in your book, and nothing is done that is said in it. I must acknowledge to you that this astonishes and displeases me. If I am deprived of the charming Mademoiselle St. Ives on account of my baptism, I give you notice. I will run away with her and unbaptize myself. The prior was confounded. His sister wept. My dear brother, said she, our nephew must not damn himself. Our holy father the Pope can give him a dispensation, and then he may be happy, in a Christian-like manner, the person he likes. The ingenuous Hercules embraced his aunt. For God's sake, said he, who is this charming man who is so gracious as to promote the amours of girls and boys? I will go and speak to him this instant. The dignity and character of the Pope was explained to him, and the Huron was still more astonished than before. My dear uncle, said he, there is not a word of all this in your book. I have travelled, and am acquainted with the sea. We are now upon the coast of the ocean, and I must leave Mademoiselle St. Ives to go and ask leave to have her of a man who lives towards the Mediterranean, four hundred leagues from hence, and whose language I do not understand. This is most incomprehensibly ridiculous, but I will go first to the Abbe of St. Ives, who lives only a league from hence, and I promise you I will wed my mistress before night. Whilst he was yet speaking, the bailiff entered, and, according to his usual custom, asked him where he was going. I am going to be married, replied the ingenuous Hercules running along, and in less than a quarter of an hour he was with his charming dear mistress, who was still asleep. Ah, my dear brother, said Mademoiselle Kirkabon to the prior, you will never make a sub-deacon of our nephew. The bailiff was very much displeased at this journey, for he had laid claim to Mademoiselle St. Ives in favor of his son, who was a still greater and more insupportable fool than his father. Chapter 6 The Huron flies to his mistress and becomes quite furious. No sooner had the ingenuous Hercules reached the house, and having asked an old servant which was his mistress's apartment, he forced open the door, which was badly fastened, and flew toward the bed. Mademoiselle St. Ives, startled out of her sleep, cried, Ah, what? Is it you? Stop! What are you about? He answered, I am going to marry. And he would, actually, have consummated nuptials, if she had not opposed him with all the decency of a young lady so well educated. The Huron did not understand raillery. He found all these evasions extremely impertinent. Miss Abakaba, my first mistress, did not behave in this manner. You have no honesty. You promised me marriage, and you will not marry. This is being deficient in the first law of honor. I will teach you to keep your word, and I will replace you in the path of virtue. He possessed an intrepid masculine virtue, worthy of his namesake Hercules, whose name he was given at his christening, and he was going to practice it in all its latitude, and the alarming outcries of the lady, more discreetly virtuous, brought the sagacious Abbe de St. Ives and his housekeeper, an old devotee servant, and the parish priest. The sight of these moderated the courage of the assailant. Good God! cried the Abbe. My dear neighbor, what are you about? My duty, replied the young man. I am fulfilling my promises, which are sacred. Mademoiselle St. Ives adjusted herself, not without blushing. The lover was conducted into another apartment. The abbé remonstrated to him the enormity of his conduct. The Huron defended himself upon the privileges of the law of nature, which he understood perfectly well. The abbé maintained that the law positive should be allowed all its advantages, and that without conventions agreed upon between men, the law of nature would almost constantly be nothing more than natural felony. Notaries, priests, witnesses, contracts, and dispensations are absolutely necessary. The ingenuous Hercules made answer with the observation constantly adopted by savages. You are then great rogues, since so many precautions are necessary. This remark somewhat disconcerted the abbe. There are, I acknowledge, libertines and cheats among us, and there would be as many among the Hurons if they were united in a great city. But at the same time we have discreet, honest, enlightened people, and these are the men who have framed the laws. The more upright we are, the more readily we should submit to them, 
as we thereby set an example to the vicious who respect those bounds which virtue has given herself. This answer struck the Huron. It has already been observed that his mind was well disposed. He was softened by flattering speeches which promised him hopes. All the world is caught in these snares, and Mademoiselle St. Ives herself appeared after having been at her toilet. Everything was now conducted with the utmost good breeding, but notwithstanding this decorum, the sparkling eyes of the ingenuous Hercules constantly made his mistress blush, and the company tremble. It was with much difficulty he was sent back to his relations. It was again necessary for the charming Mademoiselle St. Ives to interfere. The more she found the influence she had upon him, the more she loved him. She made him depart, and was much afflicted at it. At length, when he was gone, the abbe, who was not only Mademoiselle St. Ives' elder brother by many years, but also her guardian, endeavoured to wean his ward from the importunities of this dreadful lover. He went to consult the bailiff, who had always intended his son for the abbe's sister and advised him to place the poor girl in a convent. This was a terrible stroke. Such a measure would, to a young lady unaffected with any particular passion, have been inexpressible punishment, but to a lovesick maid, equally sagacious and tender, it was despair itself. When the ingenuous Hercules returned to the priors, he related all that had happened with his usual frankness. He met with the same remonstrances which had some effect upon his mind, though none upon his senses. But the next day, when he wanted to return to his mistress, in order to reason with her upon the law of nature and the law of convention, the bailiff acquainted him with insulting joy that she was in a convent. "'Very well,' said he. "'I'll go and reason with her in this convent.' "'That cannot be,' said the bailiff, and then entered into a long explanation of the nature of a convent, telling him that this word was derived from conventus in Latin, which signifies an assembly. The Huron could not comprehend why he might not be admitted to this assembly. He was informed that this assembly was a kind of prison in which girls were shut up, a shocking institution, unknown in Huronia and in England. He became furious, as was his namesake Hercules, when Eurytus, king of the Ochalia, not less cruel than the abbe of St. Ives, refused him the beauteous Iola, his daughter, not inferior in beauty to the abbe's sister. He was upon the point of going to set fire to the convent and to carry off his mistress, or be burnt with her. Mademoiselle Kirkabon, terrified at such a declaration, gave up all hope of ever seeing her nephew a subdeacon, and weeping said, The devil was certainly in him since he has been christened. Chapter 7. The Huron Repulses the English. The ingenuous Hercules walked toward the sea-coast, wrapped in a deep and gloomy melancholy, with his double-charged fusee upon his shoulder and his cutlass by his side, shooting now and then a bird, and often tempted to shoot himself. But he had still some affection for life, for the sake of his dear mistress. By turns cursing his uncle and aunt, all lower Brittany and his christening, and then blessing them, as they had introduced him to the knowledge of her he loved. He resolved upon going to burn the convent, and he stopped short for fear of burning his mistress. The waves of the channel are not more agitated by the easterly and westerly winds than was his heart by so many contrary emotions. He was walking very fast along, without knowing whither he was going, when he heard the beat of a drum. He saw at a great distance a vast multitude, part of whom ran toward the coast, and the other part flew from it. A thousand shrieks echoed on every side. Curiosity and courage hurried him that instant toward the spot where the greatest clamor arose, which he attained in a few steps. The commander of the militia, who had supped with him at the priors, knew him immediately, and he ran to the Huron with open arms. Ah, it is the sincere American! He will fight for us! Upon which the militia, which were almost dead with fear, recovered themselves, crying out with one voice, It is the Huron, the ingenuous Huron. Gentlemen, said he, what is the matter? Why are you so scared? Have they shut your mistresses up in convents? Instantly a thousand confused voices cried out, Do you not see the English who are landing? Very well, said the Huron. They are brave people. They never proposed making me a subdeacon. They never carried off my mistress. 
The commander made him understand that they were coming to pillage the Abbey of the Mountain, drink his uncle's wine, and perhaps carry off Mademoiselle St. Ives, that the little vessel which had set him on shore in Brittany had come only to reconnoitre the coast, that they were committing acts of hostility without having declared war against France, and that the province was entirely exposed to them. If this be the case, said he, they violate the law of nature. Let me alone. I lived a good while among them. I am acquainted with their language, and I will speak to them. I cannot think that they have so wicked a design. During this conversation, the English fleet approached. The Huron ran toward it, and having jumped into a little boat, soon rowed to the admiral's ship, and, having gone on board, asked whether it was true that they were come to ravage the coast without having honestly declared war. The admiral and all his crew burst into laughter, made him drink some punch, and sent him back. The ingenuous Hercules, piqued at this reception, thought now of nothing else but beating his old friends for his countrymen and the prior. The gentlemen of the neighborhood ran from all quarters and joined them. They had some cannon, and he discharged them one after the other. The English landed, and he flew toward them when he killed three of them with his own hands. He even wounded the admiral who had made a joke of him. The whole militia were animated with his prowess. The English returned to their ships and went on board and the whole coast echoed with the shouts of victory. Long live the king! Long live the ingenuous Hercules! Every one ran to embrace him. Every one strove to stop the bleeding of some slight wounds he had received. Ah, said he, if Mademoiselle St. Ives were here, she would put on a plaster for me. The bailiff, who had hid himself in his cellar during the battle, came to pay his compliments like the rest but he was greatly surprised when he heard the ingenuous Hercules say to a dozen young men well disposed for his service who surrounded him, My friends, having delivered the Abbey of the Mountains is nothing. We must rescue a nymph. The warm blood of these youth were fired at the expression. He was already followed by crowds who repaired to the convent. If the bailiff had not immediately acquainted the commandant with their design, and he had not sent a detachment after the joyous troop, the thing would have been done. The Huron was conducted back to his uncle and aunt, who overwhelmed him with tears and tenderness. I see very well, said his uncle, that you will never be either a subdeacon or a prior. You will be an officer, and one still braver than my brother, the captain, and probably as poor. Mademoiselle Kirkabon could not stop an incessant flood of tears, while she embraced him, saying, He will be killed, too, like my brother. It were much better he were a subdeacon. The Huron had, during the battle, picked up a large purse full of guineas, which probably the admiral lost. He had no doubt that this purse would buy all Lower Brittany, and, above all, make Mademoiselle St. Ives a great lady. Every one persuaded him to repair to Versailles to receive the recompense due his service. The commandant and the principal officers furnished him with certificates in abundance. The uncle and aunt also approved this journey. He was to be presented to the king without any difficulty. This alone would give him great weight in the province. These two good folks added to the English purse a considerable present out of their own savings. The Huron said to himself, When I see the king, I will ask Mademoiselle St. Ives of him in marriage, and certainly he will not refuse me. He set out accordingly, amidst the acclamations of the whole district, stifled with embraces, bathed in tears by his aunt, blessed by his uncle, and recommending himself to the charming Mademoiselle St. Ives. The End of Chapters 3 through 7「This is chapters 8 through 12 of the Sincere Huron, or L'Ingenue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This recording by Roy Schreiber. Chapter 8. The Huron goes to court, sups upon the road with some Huguenots. The ingenuous Hercules took the Samur road in the coach because that was, at that time, the only conveyance. When he came to Samur, he was astonished to find the city almost deserted, and see several families going away. He was told that half a dozen years before, Samur contained upwards of fifty thousand inhabitants, and that at present there were not six thousand. 
He mentioned this at an inn whilst he stopped. Several Protestants were at table. Some complained bitterly. Others trembled with rage. Others weeping said, We abandon our sweet fields, we fly our country. And why do you fly from your country, gentlemen? Because we must otherwise acknowledge the Pope. And why not acknowledge him? Have you no godmothers, then, that you want to marry? For I am told that he is the one that grants this permission. Ah, sir, the Pope says that he is master of the domains of kings. But, gentlemen, what religion are you of? Why, sir, we are for the most part drapers and manufacturers. If the Pope, says he, is the master of your clothes and manufactures, you do very well not to acknowledge him. But as to kings, this is their business, and why do you trouble yourself with it? Here a little black man took up the argument, and very learnedly set forth the grievances of the company. He talked of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes with so much energy. He deplored, in so pathetic a manner, the fate of fifty thousand fugitive families, and of fifty thousand others converted by dragoons, that the ingenuous Hercules could not refrain from shedding tears. Whence arises, said he, that so great a king, whose renown expands itself even to the Hurons, should thus deprive himself of so many hearts that would have loved him, and so many arms that would have served him. Because he has been imposed upon, like other great kings, replied the little orator, he has been made to believe that as soon as he utters a word, all people think as he does, and that he can make us change our religion, just as his musician Lully, in a moment, changes the decorations of his opera. He has not only already lost five or six hundred thousand very useful subjects, but he has turned many of them into enemies, and King William, who is at this time master of England, has composed several regiments of these identical Frenchmen, who otherwise would have fought for their monarch. Such a disaster is the more astonishing, as the present Pope, to whom Louis the Fourteenth sacrifices a part of his people, is his declared enemy. A violent quarrel has subsisted between them for near nine years. It has been carried so far that France was in hopes at length of casting off the yoke by which it has been kept in subjugation for so many ages to this foreigner, and, more particularly, of not giving him any more money, which is the prime business of the affairs of this world. It therefore appears evident that this great king has been imposed upon, as well with respect to his interest, as the extent of his power, and that even the magnanimity of his heart has been struck at. The Huron melted more and more, and asked, who were the Frenchmen who thus deceived a monarch so dear to the Hurons? They are the Jesuits, he was answered, and particularly Father Lachaise, the king's confessor. It is to be hoped that God will one day punish them for it, and that they will be driven out, as they now drive us. Can any misfortune equal ours? Monsieur Levois besets us on all sides with Jesuits and dragoons. Well, gentlemen, replied the Huron, who could contain himself no longer. I am going to Versailles to receive the recompense due my services. I will speak to Monsieur de Lavoie. I am told it is he who makes war from his closet. I shall see the king, and I will acquaint him with the truth. It is impossible not to yield to this truth when it is felt. I shall return very soon to marry Mademoiselle St. Ives, and I beg you will be present at our nuptials. These good people now took him for some great lord who travelled incognito in the coach. Some took him for the king's fool. There was at table a disguised Jesuit, who acted as a spy for the Reverend Father de la Chaise. He gave him an account of everything that passed, and Father de la Chaise reported what the spy wrote to Monsieur de Lavoie. The Huron and the letter arrived almost at the same time at Versailles. Chapter 9 The Arrival of the Huron at Versailles Reception at Court the ingenuous Huron was set down from a pot de chambre, a vehicle that goes from Paris to Versailles, which resembles a little covered tumbrel, in the court of the kitchens. He asked the chairman what hour the king can be seen. The chairman laughed in his face just as the English admiral had done, and he treated them in the same manner. He beat them. They were for retaliation, and the scene had liked to have proved bloody. 
if a life guardsman who was a gentleman of Brittany had not passed by and dispersed the mob. Sir, said the traveller to him, you appear to me to be a brave man. I am nephew to the prior of Our Lady of the Mountain. I have killed Englishmen, and I have come to speak to the king. I beg you will conduct me to his chamber. The soldier, ravished to find a man of courage from his province, who did not seem acquainted with the customs of the court, told him that this was not the manner of speaking to the king, that it was necessary to be presented by Monsieur de Lavoie. Very well, then, conduct me to Monsieur Lavoie, who will doubtless conduct me to the king. It is more difficult, resumed the soldier, to speak to Monsieur Lavoie than to the king, but I will conduct you to Monsieur Alexander, first commissioner at war and this will be just the same as if you spoke to the minister. They accordingly repair to Monsieur Alexander's, who is first clerk, but they cannot be introduced, he being closely engaged in business with a lady of the court, and no person is allowed admittance. Well, said the life guardsman, there is no harm done. Let us go to Monsieur Alexander's first clerk. This will be just the same as if you spoke to Monsieur Alexandre himself. The Huron, quite astonished, followed him. They remained together a half-hour in a little antechamber. "'What is this?' said the ingenuous Huron. "'Is all the world invisible in this country? It is much easier to fight in Lower Brittany against Englishmen than to meet with people at Versailles with whom one hath business.' He then amused himself for some time with relating his amours to his countrymen. But the clock striking recalled the soldier to his post. When a mutual promise was given of meeting on the morrow, the Huron remained another half hour in the antechamber, ruminating upon Mademoiselle Saint Ives and the difficulty of speaking to kings and first clerks. At length the patron appeared. Sir, said the ingenuous Hercules, if I had waited to repulse the English as long as you have made me wait for my audience, they would certainly have ravaged all of Lower Brittany without opposition. These words struck the clerk. He at length said, to the inhabitant of Brittany, what is your request? A recompense, said the other. These are my titles, showing his certificates. The clerk read, and told him that probably he might obtain leave to purchase a lieutenancy. Me? What? Must I pay money for having repulsed the English? Must I pay a tax to be killed for you, whilst you are peaceably giving your audiences here? You are certainly jesting. I require a company of cavalry for nothing. I require the king shall set Mademoiselle St. Ives at liberty from the convent, and that he give her to me in marriage. I want to speak to the king in favor of fifty thousand families, whom I propose restoring to him. In a word, I want to be useful. Let me be employed and advanced. What is your name, sir, who talk in such a high style? Oh, oh, answered the Huron. You have not then read my certificates? This is the way? They are treated. My name is Hercules de Kirkabon. I am christened, and I am lodged at the Blue Dial. The clerk concluded, like the people of Samor, that his head was turned, and did not pay him any further attention. The same day, the Reverend Father de la Chaise, confessor to Louis the Fourteenth, received his spy's letter, which accused the Breton Kirkabon of favoring in his heart the Huguenots, and condemning the conduct of the Jesuits. M. de Lavoie had, on his side, received a letter from the inquisitive bailiff, which depicted the Huron as a wicked, lewd fellow inclined to burn convents and carry off the nuns. Hercules, after having walked in the gardens of Versailles, which had become irksome to him, after having supper, like a native of Huronia and Lower Brittany, had gone to rest in the pleasing hope of seeing the king the next day, obtaining Mademoiselle St. Ives in marriage, having, at least, a company of cavalry, and of setting aside the persecution against the Huguenots. He was rocking himself asleep with these flattering ideas, when the constables entered his chamber, and seized upon his double-charged fusée and his great sabre. They took in an inventory of his ready money, and then conducted him to the castle erected by King Charles V, son of John II near the street of St. Antoine, at the gate of the Tournelles. What was the Huron's astonishment in his way thither the reader is left to imagine? He at first fancied it was all a dream, and remained for some time in a state of stupefaction. 
presently transported with rage that gave him more than common strength, he collared two of his conductors who were with him in the coach, flung them out the door, cast himself after them, and then dragged the third who wanted to hold him. He fell in the attempt, and then they tied him up and replaced him in the carriage. This, then, said he, is what one gets for driving the English out of Lower Brittany. What would you say, my charming Mademoiselle St. Ives, if you could see me in this situation? They at length arrived at the place of their destination. He was carried without any noise into the chamber in which he was to be locked up like a dead corpse going into the grave. This room was already occupied by an old solitary student of Port Royal named Gordon, who had been languishing there for two years. See, said the chief of the constables, here is company I bring you, and immediately the enormous bolts on this strong door, secured with large iron bars, were fastened upon them. These two captives were thus separated from all the universe besides. Chapter 10 the Huron is shut up in the Bastille with a Jansenist. Monsieur Gordon was a healthy old man of serene disposition, who was acquainted with two great things. The one was to bear adversity, the other to console the afflicted. He approached his companion with an open sympathizing air, and said to him, whilst he embraced him, Whoever thou art that is come to partake of my grave, be assured that I shall constantly forget myself to soften your torments in the infernal abyss wherein we are plunged. Let us adore Providence that has conducted us here. Let us suffer in peace and trust in hope. These words had the same effect upon the youth as English drops, which recall a dying person to life, and show to his astonished eyes a glimpse of light. After the first compliments were over, Gordon, without urging him to relate the cause of his misfortune, inspired him by the sweetness of his discourse, and by that interest which two unfortunate persons share with each other, with a desire of opening his heart, and of disburdening himself of the weight which oppressed him. But he could not guess the cause of his misfortune, and the good man Gordon was as much astonished as himself. God must doubtless, said the Jansenist to the Huron, have great designs upon you, since he conducted you from Lake Ontario into England, from thence into France, caused you to be baptized in Lower Brittany, and has now lodged you here for your salvation. In faith, says Hercules, I believe the devil alone has interfered in my destiny. My countrymen in America would never have treated me with the barbarity I have experienced. They have not the least idea of it. They are called savages. They are good people, but rustic, and the men of this country are refined villains. I am indeed, said he, greatly surprised to have come from another world to be shut up under four bolts with a priest. But when I consider what an infinite number of men set out from one hemisphere to go and get killed in the other, and are cast away in the voyage, and are eaten by the fishes, I cannot discover the gracious designs of God over all these people. Their dinner was brought them through a wicket. The conversation turned upon providence, letters of cachet, and upon the art of not sinking under disgrace to which all men in this world are exposed. It is two years since I have been here, said the old man, without any other consolation than myself and books, and yet I have never been a single moment out of temper. Ah, Monsieur Gordon, cried Hercules, you are not then in love with your godmother. If you were as well acquainted with Mademoiselle St. Ives as I am, you would be in a state of desperation. At these words he could not refrain from tears, which greatly relieved him from his oppression. How is it, then, that tears solace us? It seems to me that they should have quite the opposite effect. My son, said the good old man, everything is physical about us. All secretions are useful to the body, and all that comforts it comforts the soul. We are the machines of providence. The ingenuous Huron, who, as we have already observed more than once, had a great share of understanding, entered deeply into consideration of this idea, the seeds whereof appeared to be within himself. After which he asked his companion why his machine for two years had been confined by four bolts. 
by effectual grace, answered Gordon. I pass for a Jansenist. I know Arnaud and Nicole. The Jesuits have persecuted us. We believe that the Pope is nothing more than a bishop, like another, and therefore Father Lachaise has obtained from the king his penitent, an order for robbing me without any justice of the most precious inheritance of man, liberty. This is strange, said the Huron. All the unhappy people I have met with have been made solely by the Pope. With respect to your effectual grace, I acknowledge I do not understand what you mean, but I consider it as a great favor that God has let me, in my misfortune, meet a man who pours into my heart such consolations as I thought myself incapable of receiving. The conversation became each day more interesting and instructive. The souls of the two captives seemed to unite in one body. The old man knew a great deal, and the young man was willing to acquire much instruction. At the end of the first month he eagerly applied himself to the study of geometry. Gordon made him read Raoul's Physics, which book was still in fashion, and he had good sense enough to find in it nothing but doubts and uncertainties. He afterwards read the first volume of the Inquiry After Truth. This instructive work gave him new light. What? said he. Does our imagination and our senses deceive us to that degree? What? Are not our ideas formed by objects? Can we not acquire them by ourselves? When he had gone through the second volume, he was not so well satisfied, and he concluded it was much easier to destroy than to build. His colleague, astonished that a young ignoramus should make such a remark, conceived a very high opinion of his understanding, and was more strongly attached to him. Your Malebranche, said he to Gordon one day, seems to have written half his book whilst in possession of his reason, and the other half in the assurance only of imagination and prejudice. Some days after, Gordon asked him what he thought of the soul, and the manner in which we receive our ideas, of volition, grace, and free agency. Nothing, replied the Huron. If I think something, it is that we are under the power of the eternal being, like the stars and the elements, that he operates everything in us, that we are small wheels of an immense machine, of which he is the soul, that he acts according to general law, and not from particular views. This is all that appears to me intelligible. All the rest is to me a dark abyss. But this, my son, would be making God the author of sin. But, Father, your effectual grace would equally make him the author of sin. For certainly all those to whom his grace was refused would sin, and not he who gives up to evil the author of evil. This sincerity greatly embarrassed the good old man. He found that all his endeavors to extricate himself from this quagmire were ineffectual, and he heaped such quantities of words upon the other, which seemed to have meaning, but which in fact had none, in the style of physical premotion, that the Huron could not help pitying him. This question evidently determined the origin of good and evil, and poor Gordon was reduced to the necessity of returning to Pandora's box. Orsamedes egg pierced by Aramaeni, the enmity between Typhoon and Osiris, and at last original sin, and these he grouped together in profound darkness, without throwing the least glimmering of, of light upon one another. However, this romance of the soul diverted their thoughts from the contemplation of their own misery, and by a strange magic the multitude of calamities dispersed throughout the world diminished the sensation of their own miseries. They did not dare complain when all mankind was in a state of sufferance. But in the repose of night, the image of the charming Mademoiselle St. Ives effaced from the mind of her lover every metaphysical and moral idea. He awoke with his eyes bathed in tears, and the old Jansenist forgot his effectual grace, and the Abbe St. Cyran, and Jansenius himself, to allow consolation to a youth whom he judged guilty of a mortal sin. After their lectures and their reasonings were over, their adventures furnished them with subjects of conversation, and after this store was exhausted they read together or separately. The Huron's understanding daily increased, and he would certainly 
have made great progress in mathematics if the thoughts of Mademoiselle St. Ives had not frequently distracted him. He read histories, which made him melancholy. The world appeared to him too wicked and too miserable. In fact, history is nothing more than a picture of crimes and misfortunes. The crowd of innocent and peaceable men are always invisible upon this vast theatre. The dramatis personae are composed of ambitious, perverse men. The pleasure which history affords is derived from the same source as tragedy, which would languish and become insipid were it not inspired by strong passions, great crimes, and piteous misfortunes. Clio must be armed with a poignard as well as Mel Ponet. Though the history of France is not less filled with horrors than those of other nations, it nevertheless appeared to him so disgusting in the beginning, so dry in the continuation, and so trifling in the end, even in the time of Henry the Fourth, ever destitute of monuments, or foreign to those fine discoveries which have illuminated other nations that he was obliged to resolve upon not being tired to go through all the particulars of obscure calamities confined to a little corner of the world. Gordon thought like him. They both laughed with pity when they read of the sovereigns of Fiesensax and Fiesensagut and Astrict. Such a study could be relished only by their heirs, if they had any. The brilliant ages of Roman Republic made him sometimes quite indifferent as to any other part of the globe. The spectacle of victorious Rome, the lawgiver of nations, engrossed his whole soul. He glowed in contemplating a people who governed for seven hundred years by the enthusiasm of liberty and glory. Thus rolled days, weeks, and months, and he would have thought himself happy in the sanctuary of despair if, it had, if he had not loved. The natural goodness of his heart softened still more when he reflected upon the prior of Our Lady of the Mountain and the sensible Kirkabon. What must they think, he would often repeat, when they can get no tidings of me? They must think me an ungrateful wretch. This idea rendered him inconsolable. He pitied those who loved him much more than he pitied himself. Chapter 11 How the Huron Discloses His Genius Reading aggrandizes the soul, and an enlightened friend affords consolation. Our captive had these two advantages in his favor, which he had never expected. I shall begin to believe in metamorphosis, for I have been transformed from a brute into a man. He formed a chosen library with part of the money which was allowed him to dispose of. His friend encouraged him to commit to writing such observations as occurred to him. These are his notes upon ancient history. I imagine that nations were for a long time like myself, that they did not become enlightened till very late, that for many ages they were occupied with nothing but the present moment which elapsed, that they thought very little of what passed and never of the future. I have traversed five or six hundred leagues in Canada, and I do not meet with any single monument not one in any way acquainted with the actions of his predecessors. Is it not the natural state of man? The human species of this continent appear to me superior to that of the other. They have extended their being for many ages by arts and knowledge. Is it because they have beards upon their chin, and God has refused this ornament to the Americans? I do not believe it, for I find the Chinese have very little beard and that they have cultivated arts for upwards of five thousand years. In effect, if their annals go back for four thousand years, the nation must necessarily have been united and in a flourishing state more than five hundred centuries. One thing particularly strikes me in this ancient history of China, which is that almost everything is probable and natural. I admire it because it is not tinctured with anything of the miraculous. Why have all other nations adopted fabulous origins? The ancient chroniclers of the history of France, who by the by are not very ancient, make the French descended from one Francus, the son of Hector. The Romans 
said they were the issue of a Phrygian, though there was not in their whole language a single word that had the least connection with the language of Phrygia. The gods had inhabited Egypt for ten thousand years, and the devil's Scythia where they engendered the Huns. I meet with nothing before Thucydides, romances similar to Amadeus's, and far less amusing apparitions, oracles, prodigies, sorceries, metamorphoses are interspersed throughout, with the explanation of dreams, which are the bases of the destiny of the greatest empires and the smallest states. Here are speaking beasts, there brutes that are adored, gods transformed into men, and men into gods. If we must have fables, let us at least have such as appear the emblem of truth. I admire the fables of philosophers, but I laugh at those of children, and I hate those of impostors. One day he hit upon the history of the Emperor Justinian. It was there related that some Apodutes of Constantinople had delivered, in very bad Greek, an edict against the greatest captain of the age, because this hero had uttered the following words in the warmth of conversation. Truth shines forth with its proper light, and people's minds are not illuminated by flaming piles. The Apodutes declared that this proposition was heretical, bordering on heresy, and that the contrary action was Catholic, universal, and Grecian. The minds of people are not enlightened, but with flaming piles, and truth cannot shine forth with its own light. These Linistolians thus condemned several discourses of the captain, and published an edict. What? said the Huron, with much emotion. Shall such people publish edicts? They are not edicts, replied Gordon. They are contradictions which all the world laughed at in Constantinople, and the Emperor the first. He was a wise prince, who knew how to reduce the Linistolian Apodides to a state incapable of doing anything but good. He knew that these gentlemen, and several other pastifors, had tried the patience of the emperors, his predecessors, with contradictions in more serious matters. He did very right, said the Huron. The pastifors should be supported and constrained. He committed several other observations to paper, which astonished old Gordon. What? said he to himself, have I consumed fifty years in instruction, and I fear I have not attained to the degree of natural good sense of this child, who is almost a savage. I tremble to think I have so arduously strengthened prejudice, and he listens to simple nature only. The good man had some little books of criticism. Some of those periodical pamphlets were in men incapable of producing anything themselves, blacken the productions of others, where a visé insults Racine, a fédite Fenelon. The Huron ran over some of them. I compare them to certain gnats that lodge their eggs in the posteriors of the finest horses, which do not, however, prevent their running. The two philosophers scarce deigned to cast their eyes upon these excrements of literature. They soon after went through the elements of astronomy. The Huron sent for some globes. He was ravished at this great spectacle. How hard it is, said he, that I should only begin to be acquainted with heaven, when the power of contemplating it is ravished from me. Jupiter and Saturn revolve in these immense spaces. Millions of suns illuminate myriads of worlds. And in this corner of the earth, whither I am cast, there are beings that deprive me of seeing and thinking of those worlds whither my eye might reach, and even that in which God created me. The light created for the whole universe is lost to me. It is not hidden from me in the northern hem horizon, where I passed my infancy and youth. Without you, my dear Gordon, I should be annihilated. Chapter 12. The Huron Sentiments upon theatrical pieces. The young Huron resembled one of those vigorous trees which planted in an ungrateful soil extends in a little time its root and branches when transferred to a more favorable spot, and 
it was extraordinary that this favourable spot should be a prison. Among the books which employed the leisure of the two captives were some poems, and the translation of Greek tragedies, and some dramatic pieces in French. Those passages that dwelt on love communicated at once pleasure and pain to the soul of the Huron. They were but so many images of his dear Mademoiselle St. Ives. The fable of the two pigeons rent his heart, but he was far estranged from his tender dove. Moliere enchanted him. He taught him the manners of Paris and of human nature. To which of his comedies do you give the preference? Doubtless to Tartuffe. I am of your opinion, said Gordon. It was a Tartuffe that flung me into this dungeon, and perhaps they were Tartuffes who have been the cause of your misfortunes. What do you think of these Greek tragedies? They are very good for Grecians. But when he read the modern Ephigenia, Phaedrus, Andromache, and Othella, he was in ecstasy. He sighed, he wept, and he learned them by heart without having any such intention. Read Rodogun, said Gordon. That is said to be a capital production. The other pieces which have given you so much pleasure are trifles compared to this. The young man had scarce got through the first page before he said, This is not written by the same author. How do you know it? I know nothing yet, but these lines touch neither my ear nor my heart. Oh, said Gordon, the versification does not signify. The Huron asked, What must I judge by then? After having read the piece very attentively, without any other design than being pleased, he looked steadfastly at his friend with astonishment, not knowing what to say. At length, being urged to give his opinion with respect to what he felt, this was the answer he made. I understood very little of the beginning, the middle disgusted me, but the last scene greatly moved me, though there appears to me but little probability in it. I have no prejudices for or against any one, but I do not remember twenty lines, I who recollect them all when they please me. This piece, nevertheless, passes for the best upon our stage. If that be the case, said he, it is perhaps like many people who are not worthy of the places they hold. After all, this is a matter of taste, and mine cannot yet be formed. I may be mistaken. But you know I am accustomed to say what I think, or rather what I feel. I suspect that illusion, fashion, and caprice often warp the judgments of men. Here he repeated some lines from Ephigenia, which he was full of, and though he declaimed them but indifferently, he uttered them with such truth and sensation that he made the old Jansenist weep. He then read Cinna, which did not excite his tears but his ad admiration. The end of chapters 8 through 12. This is chapter 13 through 17 of The Sincere Huron, or L'Ingenue, by Voltaire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and recorded here by Roy Schreiber. Chapter 13 The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives goes to Versailles. Whilst the unfortunate Huron was more enlightened than consoled, whilst his genius, so long stifled, unfolded itself with so much rapidity and strength, whilst nature, which was attaining a degree of perfection in him, avenged herself of the outrages of fortune. What became of the prior, his good sister, and the beautiful recluse, Mademoiselle St. Ives? The first month they were uneasy, and the third they were immersed in sorrow. False conjectures, ill-grounded reports alarmed them. At the end of six months it was concluded he was dead. At length, Monsieur and Mademoiselle Kirkabon learned by a letter of ancient date which one of the king's guards had written to Brittany, that a young man resembling the Huron arrived one night at Versailles, but that since that time no one had heard him spoken of. "'Alas!' said Mademoiselle Kirkabon, "'our nephew has done some ridiculous thing which has brought on some terrible consequences. He is young, a low Breton, and cannot know how to behave at court. My dear brother, 
I never saw Versailles nor Paris. Here is a fine opportunity, and we shall, perhaps, find our poor nephew. He is our brother's son, and it is our duty to assist him. Who knows, we may perhaps at length prevail upon him to become a sub-deacon, when the fire of his youth is somewhat abated. He was much inclined to the sciences. Do you recollect how he reasoned upon the Old and New Testament? We are answerable for his soul. He was baptized at our instigation. His dear mistress, Mademoiselle St. Ives, does nothing but weep incessantly. Indeed, we must go to Paris. If he is concealed in any of those infamous houses of pleasure, which I have often heard of, we will get him out." The prior was affected at his sister's discourse. He went in search of the Bishop of St. Malo, who had baptized the Huron, and requested his protection and advice. The prelate approved of the journey. He gave the prior letters of recommendation to Father Lachaise, the king's confessor, who was invested with the first dignity of the kingdom to Harlay, Bishop of Paris, and to Bousseau, Bishop of Meaux. At length the brother and the sister set out, but when they came to Paris they found themselves bewildered in a great labyrinth without clue or end. Their fortune was but middling, and they had occasion every day for carriages to pursue their discovery, which they could not accomplish. The prior waited upon the Reverend Father La Chaise. He was with Mademoiselle Duchon, and could not give audience to priors. He went to the archbishop's door. The prelate was shut up with the beautiful Mademoiselle Le Diguier about church matters. He flew to the country house of the Bishop of Meaux. He was upon close examination of Mademoiselle de Melan about the mystical amour of Mademoiselle Guillon. At length, however, he gained access to these two prelates. They both declared they could not interfere with regard to his nephew, as he was not a subdeacon. He at length saw the Jesuit, who received him with open arms, protesting he had always entertained the greatest private esteem for him, though he had never known him. He swore that his society had always been attached to the inhabitants of Lower Brittany. But, said he, has not your nephew the misfortune of being a Huguenot? No, certainly, Reverend Father. May he not be a Jansenist? I can assure your reverence, he is scarce a Christian. It is about eleven months since he was christened. This is very well. We will take care of him. Is your benefice considerable? No, a very trifle, and our nephew costs us a great deal. Are there any Jansenists in your neighborhood? Take great care, my dear Monsieur Prior. They are more dangerous than Huguenots, or even atheists. My reverend father, we have none. It is not even known at Our Lady of the Mountain what Jansenism is. So much the better. Go, there is nothing I will not do for you. He dismissed the prior in this affectionate manner, but thought no more about him. Time slipped away, and the prior and his good sister were almost in despair. In the meanwhile, the cursed bailiff urged very strenuously the marriage of his great booby of a son with the beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives, who was taken purposely out of the convent. She always entertained a passion for her godson in proportion as she detested the husband who was designated for her. The insult that had been offered her by shutting her up in a convent increased her affection and the mandate for wedding the bailiff's son completed her antipathy for him. Chagrin, tenderness, and terror racked her soul. Love, we know, is much more inventive and more daring in a young woman than friendship in an aged prior and an aunt upwards of forty-five. Besides, she had received good instruction in her convent with the assistance of romances which she had read by stealth. The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives remembered the letter that had been written by the life guardsman to Lower Brittany, and which had been spoken of in the province. She resolved to go herself and gain information at Versailles, to throw herself at the minister's feet if her husband should be in prison, as it was said, and to obtain justice for him. 
I know not what secret intelligence she gained that at court nothing is refused a pretty woman, but she knew not the price of these boons. Having taken this resolution, it afforded her some consolation, and she enjoyed some tranquillity without upbraiding Providence with the severity of her lot. She receives her detested, intended father-in-law, caresses the brother, and spreads happiness throughout the house. On the day appointed for the ceremony, she secretly departs at four in the morning with the little nuptial presents she had received and all she could gather. Her plan was so well laid that she was above ten leagues upon her journey when, about noon, her absence was discovered, and when every one's consternation and surprise was inexpressible. The inquisitive bailiff asked more questions that day than he would done for a week. The intended bridegroom was more stupefied than ever. The Abbe St. Ives resolved in his rage to pursue his sister. The bailiff and his son were disposed to accompany him. Their fate led almost the whole canton of Lower Brittany to Paris. The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives was not without apprehensions that she should be pursued. She rode on horseback, and she got all the intelligence she could without being suspected from couriers if they had not met a fat abbe, an enormous bailiff, and a young booby, galloping as fast as they could to Paris. Having learned, on the third day, that they were not far behind, she took quite a different road and was skilful and lucky enough to arrive in Versailles, whilst they, in a fruitless pursuit after her, at Paris. But how was she to behave at Versailles, young, handsome, untutored, unsupported, unknown, exposed to every danger? How could she dare go in search of the king's guards? She had some thoughts of applying to a Jesuit of low rank, for there were some for every station of life, as God, they say, has given different ailments to every species of animal. He had given the king his confessor, who is called by all solicitors of benefices the head of the Galatian church. Then came the prince's confessors. The ministers had none. They were not such dupes. There were Jesuits, for genteel mobs of people, and particularly those for chambermaids, by whom were known the secrets of their mistresses, and this was no small vocation. The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives addressed herself to one of these last, who was called Father Tutatus. She confessed to him, set forth her adventure, her situation, her danger, and conjured him to get her a lodging with some good devotee who might shelter her from temptations. Father Tutatus introduced her to the wife of the cup-bearer, one of his most trusty penitents. From the moment Mademoiselle St. Ives became her lodger, she did her utmost to obtain the confidence and friendship of this woman. She gained intelligence of the Breton guard, and invited him to visit her. Having learned from him that her lover had been carried off, after having had a conference with one of the first clerks, she flew to this clerk. The sight of a fine woman softened him, for it must be allowed God created woman only to tame mankind. The scribe, thus mollified, acknowledged to her everything. Your lover has been in the Bastille almost a year, and without your intercession he would, perhaps, have ended his days there. The tender Mademoiselle St. Eyes swooned at this intelligence. When she recovered herself, the penman told her, I have no power to do good. All my influence extends to doing harm sometimes. Take my advice. Wait upon Monsieur de saint Poange, who has the power of doing both good and ill. He is Monsieur de Lavoie's cousin and favorite. This minister has two souls. The one is Monsieur de saint Poange, and the other Mademoiselle de Belly. But she is at present absent from Versailles, so that you have nothing to do but captivate the protector I have pointed out to you. The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives, divided between some trifling joy and excessive grief, between a glimmering of hope and dreadful apprehensions, pursued by her brother, idolizing her lover, 
wiping her tears which flowed in torrents, trembling and feeble, yet summoned all her courage, and in this situation she flew on the wings of love to Monsieur de saint Polange. Chapter 14. The Progress of the Huron's Intellect the ingenuous youth was making a rapid progress in the sciences and particularly in the science of man the cause of this sudden disclosure of his understanding was as much owing to his savage education as to the disposition of his soul for having learned nothing in his infancy he had not imbibed any prejudices his mind not having been warped by error had retained all its primitive rectitude he saw things as they were whereas the ideas that were communicated to us in our infancy made us see them all our life in a false light. "'Your persecutors are abominable wretches,' said he to his friend Gordon. "'I pity you for being oppressed, but I condemn you for being a Jansenist. All sects appear to me to be founded in error. Tell me if there be any sectaries in geometry.' No, my child, said the good old Gordon, heaving a deep sigh. All men are agreed concerning truth when demonstrated. But they are too much divided about latent truths. If there be but a single truth in your load of arguments, which have so often been sifted for such a number of ages, it would doubtless have been discovered, and the universe would certainly have been unanimous at least in that respect. If this truth had been necessary, as the sun is to the earth, it would have been as brilliant as that planet. It is an absurdity, an insult to human nature. It is an attack upon the infinite and supreme being to say that there is an essential truth to the happiness of man which God conceals. All that this ignorant youth instructed only by nature said made a very deep impression upon the mind of the old unhappy annotator is it really certain he cried that i should have made myself truly miserable for mere fantasies i am much more certain of my misery than of effectual grace i have spent my time in reasoning upon the liberty of god and human nature but i have lost my own neither st augustine nor st prosper will extricate me from my present misfortunes the ingenuous huron who gave way to his natural characteristic at length said would you give me leave to speak to you boldly and frankly those who bring upon themselves persecution for such idle disputes seem to me to have little sense those who persecute appear to me monsters the two captives entirely coincided with respect to the injustice of their captivity. I am a hundred times more to be pitied than you, said the Huron. I am born free as the air. I had two lives, liberty and the object of my love, and I am deprived of both. We are both in fetters without knowing who put them on us, and without being able to inquire. I lived a Huron for twenty years. It is said they are barbarians because they avenge themselves on their enemies, but they never oppress their friends. I had scarce set foot in France before I shed my blood for this country. I have, perhaps, preserved a whole province, and my recompense is being swallowed up in this tomb of the living, where I have died with rage had it not been for you. There must be no laws in this country. Men are condemned without being heard. This is not the case in England. Alas! It is not against the English I should have fought. Thus his growing philosophy could not brook nature being insulted in the first of her rights, and he gave vent to his just collar. His companion did not contradict him. Absence ever increases ungratified love, and philosophy does not diminish it. He as frequently spoke of his dear Mademoiselle St. Ives as he did of morality or metaphysics. The more he purified his sentiments, the more he loved. He read some new romances, but he met with few that depicted to him the real state of his soul. He always felt that his heart stretched beyond the bounds of his author. Alas, said he, 
almost all writers have nothing but wit and art. At length the good Jansenist priest became insensibly the confidant of his tendernesses. He was hitherto acquainted with love as sin with which penitents accused themselves at confession. He now learned to know it as a sentiment equally noble and tender which can elevate the soul as well as soften it, and can produce, sometimes, virtues. In fine, for the last miracle, a Huron converted a Jansenist. Chapter 15. The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives resists some delicate proposals. The charming Mademoiselle St. Ives, still more afflicted than her lover, waited accordingly upon Monsieur de saint Poange, accompanied by her friend with whom she lodged, each having their faces covered with their hoods. The first thing she saw at the door was the Abbe St. Ives, her brother, coming out. She was terrified. But her fi pious friend supported her spirits. For the very reason, said she, that people have been speaking against you, speak to him yourself. You may be assured that the accusers in this part of the world are always in the right, unless they are immediately detected. Besides, your presence will have greater effect, or else I am much mistaken, than the words of your brother. Ever so little encouragement to a passionate lover makes her intrepid. Mademoiselle St. Ives appears at the audience. Her youth, her charms, her languishing eyes, moistened with some involuntary tears, attracted everyone's attention. Every sycophant that the deputy minister forgot for an instant the idol of power to contemplate that of beauty. St. Paul Ange conducted her into a closet. She spoke with an affecting grace. St. Paul Ange felt some emotion. She trembled, but he told her not to be afraid. Return tonight, he said. Your business requires some reflection, and it must be discussed at leisure. There are too many people here at present. Audiences are rapidly dispatched. I must get to the bottom of all that concerns you." He then paid her some compliments upon her beauty and manner of thinking, and advised her to come at seven in the evening. She did not fail, attending at the hour appointed and her pious friend again accompanied her. She kept in the hall where she was reading the Christian pedagogue, while St. Poange and the beauteous Mademoiselle St. Ives were in the back closet. He began by saying, Would you believe it, Mademoiselle, that your brother has been here to request me to grant him a letter de cachet against you? But indeed I would sooner grant one to send him back to Lower Brittany. Alas, sir, said she, letters de cachet are granted very liberally in your offices, since people come from the extremities of the kingdom to solicit them like pensions. I am very far from requesting one against my brother, yet I have much reason to complain of him, but I respect the liberty of mankind, and therefore I supplicate for that of a man whom I want to make my husband, of a man to whom the king is indebted for the preservation of a province, who can beneficially serve him, and who is the son of an officer killed in his service. What is he accused of? How could he be treated so cruelly without being heard? The deputy minister then showed her the letter of the spy Jesuit, and that of the perfidious bailiff. What? said she with astonishment. Are there such monsters upon the earth? And would they force me to marry a stupid son of a ridiculous wicked man? And is it upon such evidence that the fate of citizens is determined? She threw herself upon her knees, and with a flood of tears solicited the freedom of a brave man who adored her. Her charms appeared to the greatest advantage in such a situation. She was so beautiful that St. Paulange, bereft of all shame, insinuated to her that she would succeed if she began by yielding to him the first fruits of what she reserved for her lover. Mademoiselle St. Ives, shocked and confused, pretended for some time not to understand him, and he was obliged to explain himself more clearly one word used with some reserve brought on another less delicate, which was succeeded by one still more expressive. 
the revocation of the lettre de cachet was not only proposed but pecuniary recompenses honours and places and the more he promised the greater was his desire of not being refused mademoiselle st ives wept whilst her anguish almost choked her half resting upon a sofa scarce able to believe what she saw and heard saint Ange in turn threw himself upon his knees he was not disagreeable and might not so much have shocked a heart less prepossessed but mademoiselle st ives adored her lover and thought it the greatest of crimes to betray him in order to serve him saint Ange renewed with greater fervency his prayers and entreaties he at length went so far as to say that this was the only means of obtaining the liberty of the man whose interest she so violently and affectionately had at heart this uncommon conversation continued for a long time the devotee in the antechamber in reading her christian pedagogue said to herself my god what can they be doing in there for these two hours my lord saint paul ange never before gave so long an audience perhaps he has refused everything to this poor girl and she still is entreating him at length her companion came out of the closet in the greatest confusion without being able to speak in deep meditation upon the character of the great and half great who so slightly sacrificed the liberty of men and the honor of women she did not utter a syllable all the way back but being returned to her friends she burst out and told all that had happened her pious friend made frequent signs of the cross my dear friend said she you must consult to-morrow father Tudatus, our director he has much influence over m de saint pontange he is confessor to many of the female servants of the house he is a pious accommodating man who has also the direction of some women of fashion yield to him this is my way and i always found myself right we weak women stand in need of a man to lead us and so my dear friend i'll go to-morrow in search of father tutatus chapter sixteen she consults a jesuit no sooner was the beautiful and disconsolate mademoiselle st ives with her holy confessor than she told him that a powerful voluptuous man had proposed to her to set at liberty the man whom she intended on making her lawful husband and that he required a great price for his service that she held such infidelity in the highest detestation and that if only her life had been required she would have sooner have sacrificed it than have submitted this most abominable sinner said father tudatus you should tell me his name this instant he must certainly be some jansenist i will inform against him to the reverend father de la chaise who will place him in the situation of your dear beloved intended bridegroom the girl after much struggle and embarrassment at length mentioned saint poange my lord saint poange cried the jesuit ah my child the case is quite different he is cousin to the greatest minister we have ever had a man of worth a protector of the good cause a good christian he could not possibly entertain such a thought you certainly must have misunderstood him oh father i did but understand him too well i am lost on whichever side i turn the only alternative i have to choose is misery or shame either my lover must be buried alive or i must make myself unworthy of living i cannot let him perish nor can i save him father tudatus endeavoured to consult her with these gentle expressions in the first place my child never use the word lover it intimates something worldly which may offend god say my husband for although he is not yet your husband you consider him such and nothing can be more decent secondly though he be ideally your husband and you are in hopes he will be such he is not so in effect consequently you will not commit adultery an enormous sin that should always be avoided as much as possible thirdly actions are not maliciously culpable when the intention is virtuous and nothing can be more virtuous than to procure your husband his liberty fourthly you have examples in holy antiquity that may miraculously serve for your guide st augustine relates that under the proconsulate of septimus in the three hundred and fortieth year of our salvation 
a poor man could not pay unto caesar what belonged to caesar and was justly condemned to die notwithstanding the maxim where there is nothing the king must lose his right the object in question was a pound of gold the culprit had a wife in whom god had united beauty and prudence an old miser promised to give a pound of gold and even more to the lady upon condition that he commit with her the sin of uncleanliness the lady thought she did not act wrong to save her husband's life st augustine highly approves of her generous resignation it is true that the old miser cheated her and perhaps her husband was none the less hanged she did all that was in her power to save his life you may assure yourself my child that when a jesuit quotes you st augustine that saint must certainly have been in the right i advise you to nothing you are prudent and it is to be presumed that you will do your husband a service my lord st Pange is an honest man he will not deceive you this is all i can say i will pray to god for you and i hope everything will take place for his glory the beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives, who is not less terrified with the Jesuits' discourse than with the proposals of the deputy minister, returned in despair to her friend. She was tempted to deliver herself by death from the horror of leaving in a shocking captivity the lover she adored, and the shame of releasing him at the dearest of all prices, which was the sole property of this unfortunate lover. Chapter 17 she yields through virtue she entreated her friend to kill her but this lady who was full as indulgent as the jesuit spoke to her still more clearly alas said she business is seldom carried out at this agreeable gallant and famous court upon any other terms the most considerable as well as the most indifferent places are seldom given away but at the price required of you my dear, you have inspired me with friendship and confidence. I will own to you that if I had been as nice as you are, my husband would not enjoy the post upon which he lives. He knows it, and so far from being displeased, he considers me his benefactress and himself my creature. Do you think all those who have been at the head of provinces or even armies have been indebted for their honors and fortunes solely for their services? There are some who are beholden to the ladies their wives. The dignities of war are solicited by the queen of love, and a place is given to him who got the handsomest wife. You are in a situation that is still more critical. The object is to let your lover see daylight, and to marry him. It is a sacred duty that you are to fulfill. No one has ever censured the great and beautiful ladies I mentioned to you. The world will applaud you. It will be said that you only allowed yourself to be guilty of a weakness through an excess of virtue. Heavens! cried Mademoiselle St. Ives. What kind of virtue is this? What a labyrinth of distress! What a world! What men to become acquainted with! A father de la chaise and a ridiculous bailiff imprison my lover. I am persecuted by my family. Assistance is offered me only that I may be dishonored. A Jesuit has ruined a brave man another jesuit wants to ruin me and on every side snares are laid for me and i am upon the very brink of destruction i must even speak to the king i will throw myself at his feet as he goes to mass or to the playhouse his attendants will not let you approach him said her good friend and if you should be so unfortunate as to speak to him Monsieur de la Voix or the Reverend Father de la Chaise might bury you in a convent for the rest of your days. Whilst this generous friend thus increased the perplexities of Mademoiselle St. Ives's tortured soul, and plunged the dagger deeper into her heart, a messenger arrived from Monsieur de Saint Paul Ange with a letter and two fine pendant earrings. Mademoiselle St. Ives with tears refused accepting any part of the contents of the packet, but her friend took the charge of them upon herself. As soon as the messenger was gone, our confidant read the letter, in which a little supper was proposed to the two friends for that night. Mademoiselle St. Ives protested she would not go, whilst her pious friend endeavoured to make her try on the diamond earrings. 
but Mademoiselle St. Ives could not endure them, and imposed it all day long. At length, being entirely wrapped up in the contemplation of her lover, overcome and dragged along, not knowing whither she was being carried, she let herself be led to the fatal supper. She remained inexorable to all treaties of putting on the earrings, so that her confidant took them with her, and placed them in her ears against her will, before they sat down to supper. Mademoiselle St. Ives was so confused and agitated by having to undergo this torment, that her patron considered it a very favorable prognostic. Toward the end of the repast her friend very prudently retired. Her patron then showed her the revocation of the lettre de cachet, the grant of a considerable recompense, and a captain's commission, which were accompanied by unlimited promises. Ah, said Mademoiselle St. Ives, with a deep sigh, how much I should love you, if you did not desire to be loved so much. In a word, after a long resistance, shrieks, cries, and torrents of tears, weakened with the conflict, overwhelmed and languishing, she was compelled to yield. And the only consolation now left her was that she resolved to think of nothing but the ingenuous Huron, whilst her cruel ravisher relentlessly enjoyed the advantage of that necessity to which she was reduced. The End of Chapters 13 through 17、This is Chapters 18 through 20 of The Sincere Huron or La Ingenue by Voltaire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It is recorded here by Roy Schreiber. Chapter 18 She Delivers Her Lover and a Jansenist. At daybreak she flew to Paris with the minister's mandate. It would be difficult to depict the agitations of her mind in this journey. Imagine a virtuous and noble soul humbled by its own reproaches, intoxicated with tenderness, distracted with the remorse of having betrayed her lover, and elated with the pleasure of releasing the object of her adoration. Her torments, her conflicts, her success, by turns engaging her reflections. She was no longer that innocent girl whose ideas were confined to a provincial education. Love and misfortune had united to new mould her. Sentiment had made a rapid progress in her mind, as reason had in that of her unfortunate lover. Girls learn to feel more easily than men learn to think. Her adventure afforded her more instruction than four years of confinement in a convent. Her dress was dictated by the greatest simplicity. She viewed with horror the trappings with which she had appeared before her fatal benefactor. Her companion had taken her earrings without her having before looked at them. Charmed and confused, idolizing the Huron and detesting herself, she at length arrived at the gate of that dreadful castle, the Palace of Vengeance, where oft crimes and innocence are alike immured. When she was upon the point of getting out of the coach, her strength failed her. Some people came to her assistance. She entered, whilst her heart was in the greatest palpitation, her eyes streaming, and her whole frame bespoke the greatest consternation. She was presented to the governor. He was going to speak to her, but she had lost all power of expression. She showed her order, whilst, with the greatest difficulty, she articulated some words. The governor entertained a great esteem for his prisoner, and he was greatly pleased at his being released. His heart was not callous like those of most of his brethren, who think of nothing but the fees their captives are to pay them, extort their revenue from their victims, and living by the misery of others, conceive a horrid joy at the lamentations of the unfortunate. He sent for the prisoner into his apartment. The two lovers swooned at the sight of each other. The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives remained for a long time motionless, without any symptoms of life. The others soon recalled his fortitude. This, said the governor, is probably the lady your wife. You did not tell me you were married. I am informed that it is through her generous solicitude that you have obtained your liberty. 
alas said the beautiful mademoiselle st ives in a faltering voice i am not worthy of being his wife and swooned again when she recovered her senses she presented with a trembling hand the grant and written promise of a company the huron equally astonished and affected awoke from one dream to fall into another why was i shut up here how could you deliver me where are the monsters that immured me you are a divinity sent from heaven to succor me the beautiful mademoiselle st ives with a dejected look looked at her lover blushed and instantly turned away her streaming eyes in a word they told him all she knew and all she had undergone except what she was willing to conceal for ever but which any other except the huron more accustomed to the world and better acquainted with the customs of courts would have easily guessed is it possible that a wretch like the bailiff can have deprived me of my liberty alas i find that men like the vilest animals can all hurt but is it possible that a monk a jesuit the king's confessor should have contributed to my misfortunes as much as the bailiff without my being able to imagine under what pretense this detestable knave has persecuted me did he make me pass for a jansenist in fine how came you to remember me i did not deserve it i was then only a savage what could you without advice without assistance undertake a journey to versailles you appeared there and my fetters were broke there must then be in beauty and virtue an invincible charm that opens the gates of the adamant and softens hearts of steel At the word virtue a flood of tears issued from the eyes of the beautiful mademoiselle st ives she did not know how far she had been virtuous in the crime which she reproached herself her lover thus continued thou angel who has broken my chains if you had sufficient influence which i do not yet comprehend to obtain justice for me obtain it likewise for an old man who first taught me to, th to think as you taught me to love misfortunes have united us i love him as a father i can neither live without you nor him i solicit the same man who yes i will be beholden to you for everything and i will owe nothing to any one but yourself write to this man in power overwhelm me with kindness complete what you have begun perfect your miracle she was sensible she ought to do everything her lover desired she wanted to write but her hand refused its office she began her letter three times and tore it up as often at length she got to the end and the two lovers left the prison after having embraced the old martyr of efficacious grace the happy yet disconsolate mademoiselle st ives knew where her brother lodged thither she repaired and her lover took an apartment in the same house they had scarce reached their lodging before her protector sent the order for the releasing of the good old gordon at the same time making an appointment with her for the next day thus was every generous and laudable action of the beautiful mademoiselle st ives performed at the price of her honor she considered with detestation this practice of selling at once the happiness and misery of man she gave the order of release to her lover and refused the appointment of a benefactor whom she could see no more without expiring without shame and grief her lover could not have left her upon any other errand than to release his friend he flew to the place of his confinement and fulfilled this duty in reflecting upon the strange vicissitudes of the world and admiring the courageous virtue of a young lady to whom two unfortunate men owed more than their lives chapter nineteen the huron the beautiful mademoiselle st ives and their relations are convened a generous and respectable but faithless girl was with her brother the abbe st ives the good prior of the mountain and lady de kirkabon they were equally astonished but their situations and sentiments were very different the abbe de st ives was expiating the wrongs he had done his sister at her feet and she pardoned him the prior and his sympathizing sister likewise wept but it was for joy the filthy bailiff and his insupportable son did not trouble this affecting scene they had set out upon the first report of their antagonist being released and they flew to bury in their own province their folly and fear the four dramatis personae variously agitated were waiting for the return of the young man who was gone to deliver his friend the abbe st ives 
not dare raise his eyes to meet those of his sister. The good Kirkabon said, I shall then see once more my dear nephew? Yes, you will see him again, said the charming Mademoiselle St. Ives, but he is no longer the same man. His behavior, his manners, his ideas, his sense, all have undergone a complete mutation. He has become as respectable as he was ignorant and strange to everything. He will be the honor and consolation of your family, could I also be the honor of mine. What? Are you not the same as you were? said the prior. What then has happened to work so great a change? During this conversation the Huron returned with the Jansenist in hand. The scene was now changed and became more interesting. It began by the uncle and the aunt's tender embraces. The Abbe de St. Ives almost kissed the knees of the ingenuous Huron, who, by the by, was no longer ingenuous. The language of the eyes formed all the discourse of the two lovers, who, nevertheless, expressed every sentiment with which they were penetrated. Satisfaction and acknowledgment sparkled in the countenance of the one, whilst embarrassment was depicted in Mademoiselle St. Ives's melting eyes, turned somewhat sideways. Every one was astonished that she should mingle grief with so much joy. The venerable Gordon soon endeared himself to the whole family. He and the young prisoner had been unhappy together, and this was sufficient title. He owed his deliverance to the two lovers, and this alone reconciled him to love. The acrimony of his former sentiments was dismissed from his heart, and he was converted to a man, as well as the Huron. Every one related his adventures before supper. The two abbés and the aunt listened like children to the relation of stories of ghosts, and like men all interested in so many calamities. Alas, said Gordon, there are perhaps upwards of five hundred virtuous people in the same fetters as Mademoiselle St. Ives has broken. Their misfortunes are unknown. Many hands are found to strike the unhappy multitude, but seldom one to succor them. This just reflection increased his sensibility and gratitude. Everything heightened the triumph of the beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives. The grandeur and intrepidity of her soul were the subject of each one's admiration. The admiration was blended with that respect which we feel, despite ourselves, for a person we think has some influence at court. But the Abbe de St. Ives sometimes said, What could my sister do to obtain this influence so soon? Supper was ready, and every one seated very early, when, lo, the worthy confidant of Versailles arrived without being acquainted with anything that had happened. She was in a coach and six, and it was easily seen to whom the equipage belonged. She entered with the air of authority assumed by people in power, who have a great deal of business saluted the company with much indifference, and pulling the beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives on one side, said, Why do you make people wait so long? Follow me. There are diamonds you forgot. However softly soever she uttered these expressions, the Huron nevertheless overheard them. He saw the diamonds. The brother was speechless. The uncle and the aunt showed that kind of surprise common to good people who had never before beheld such magnificence. The young man, whose mind was now formed by twelve months of reflection, could not help making some against his will, and was for a moment in anxiety. His mistress perceived it, and a mortal paleness spread itself over her countenance. A tremor seized her, and it was with difficulty that she supported herself. "'Ah, madam,' said she to her fatal friend, "'you have ruined me. You have given me the mortal blow.' These words pierced the heart of the Huron, but he had already learned to possess himself. He did not dwell upon them, lest he should make his mistress uneasy before her brother, but turn pale as well as her. Mademoiselle St. Ives, distracted with the change she perceived in her lover's countenance, pulled the woman out of the room into the passage, and there threw the jewels at her feet, saying, Alas! You know they were not my seducers. But he that gave them to me shall never set eyes on me again. A friend took them up, whilst Mademoiselle St. Ives added, He may either take them again, or give them to you, be gone, and do not make me still more odious to myself. The female ambassador, 
at length returned, not being able to comprehend the remorse to which she had been witness. The beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives, greatly oppressed, and feeling a revolution in her body that almost suffocated her, was compelled to go to bed. But that she might not alarm any one, she kept her pains and sufferings to herself, and, under pretense of only being weary, she asked leave to take a little rest. This, however, she did not do till she had reanimated the company with the consolatory and flattering expressions, and cast such a look upon her lover as darted fire into his soul. The supper, which she was not fond of, was in the beginning gloomy, but this gloominess was of that interesting kind that affords attracting and useful conversation, so superior to that frivolous joy sought for, and which is usually nothing more than a troublesome noise. Gordon, in a few words, gave the history of Jansenism and Molinism, of those persecutions with which one party hampered the other, and of the obstinacy of both. The Huron entered into a criticism thereupon, pitying those men who, not satisfied with all the confusion occasioned by their opposite interests, create evils by imaginary interests and unintelligible absurdities. Gordon related, the other judged, the guest listened with emotion, and gained new lights. The length of misfortunes and the shortness of life then became the topics. It was remarked that all professions have peculiar vices and dangers annexed to them, and that from the prince down to the lowest beggar all seem alike to accuse providence. How happens it that so many men, for so little, perform the office of persecutor, sergeants, and executioners to others? With what inhuman indifference does a man in place sign the destruction of a family, and with what joy, still more barbarous, do mercenaries execute them? I saw in my youth, said the good old Gordon, a relation of the Marshal de Marillac, being persecuted in his own province on account of that illustrious but unfortunate man, concealed himself under a borrowed name in Paris. He was an old man, near seventy-two years of age. His wife, who accompanied him, was nearly of the same age. They had had a libertine son, who, at fourteen years of age, absconded from his father's house, turned soldier, and deserted. He had gone through every gradation of debauchery and misery. At length, having changed his name, he was in the guards of Cardinal Richelieu, for this priest, as well as Mazarin, had guards, and had obtained an exempt staff in their company of sergeants. This adventurer was appointed to arrest the old man and his wife, and acquitted himself with all the obduracy of a man who was willing to please his master. As he was conducting them, he heard these two victims deplore the long succession of miseries which had befallen them from their cradle. This aged couple reckoned as one of their greatest misfortunes the wildness and loss of their son. He recollected them, but he nevertheless led them to prison, assuring them that his reverence was to be served in preference to everybody else. His eminence rewarded his zeal. I have seen a spy of Father de la Chaise betray his own brother in hopes of a little benefice which he did not obtain, and I saw him die, not of remorse, but of grief at having been cheated by the Jesuit. The vocation of a confessor, which I for a long while exercised, made me acquainted with the secrets of families. I have known very few who, though immersed in the greatest distress, did not externally wear the mask of felicity, and every appearance of joy. And I have always observed that great grief was the fruit of our unconstrained desires. For my part, said the Huron, I imagine that a noble, grateful, and sensible man may always be happy, and I doubt not but to enjoy an uncheckered felicity with the charming, generous Mademoiselle St. Ives. For I flatter myself, added he, in addressing himself to her brother with a friendly smile, that you will not now refuse me as you did last year. Besides, I shall pursue a more decent method. The abbé was confounded in apologies for the past, and in protesting an eternal attachment. Uncle Kirkamon said this would be the most glorious day of his whole life. His good aunt, in ecstasies and floods of joy, cried out, 
I always said you would never be a subdeacon. This sacrament is preferable to the other. Would to God I had been honoured with it. But I shall serve you as a mother. And now every one vied with each other in applauding gentle Mademoiselle St. Ives. Her lover's heart was too full of what she had done for him, and he loved her too much for the affair of the jewels to make any predominant impression on him. But those words which he too well heard, you have given me the mortal blow, still secretly terrified him, and interrupted all his joy, whilst the compliments paid his beautiful mistress still increased his love. In a word, nothing was thought of but her nothing was mentioned but the happiness those two lovers deserved a plan was agitated to live together in paris and schemes of grandeur and fortitude succeeded these hopes which the smallest ray of happiness engenders strongly operated but the huron felt in the secret recess of his heart a sentiment that exploded this illusion he read over the promises signed by saint Ange and the commission signed by Louvois. These men were painted to him such as they were, or such as they were thought to be. Every one spoke of the ministers and the administration, the freedom of convivial conversation, which is considered in France as the most precious liberty to be obtained on earth. If I were King of France, said the Huron, this is the kind of minister that I would choose for the War Department. I would have a man of the highest birth, as he is to give orders to the nobility, I would require that he should be himself an officer, and pass through the various gradations, or at least that he had attained the rank of lieutenant-general, and was worthy of being a marshal of France. For is it not necessary that he should have served himself, be acquainted with the details of service, and will not officers obey with a hundred times more acrility a military man who like themselves has been singleized by his courage than a mere man of the cabinet who at most can only guess at the operations of a campaign let him have ever so great a share of sense i should not be displeased at my minister's generosity even though it might sometimes embarrass a little the keeper of the royal treasure i should choose him to have a facility in business and that he should distinguish himself by that kind of gaiety of mind which is the lot of a man superior to business, so agreeable to the nation, and which renders the performance of every duty less irksome. This is the character he would have chosen for a minister, as he had constantly observed that such an amiable disposition is incompatible with cruelty. M. de Lavoie would not, perhaps, have been satisfied with the Huron's wishes. His merit lay in a different walk, but whilst they were still at table, the disorder of this unhappy girl took a fatal turn. Her blood was on fire, the symptoms of a malignant fever had appeared. She suffered, but did not complain, unwilling to disturb the pleasure of the guests. Her brother, knowing that she was not asleep, went to the foot of her bed. He was astonished at the condition he found her in. Everybody flew to her. Her lover appeared next to her brother. He was certainly the most alarmed and the most affected of any one, but he had learned to unite discretion to all the happy gifts nature had bestowed upon him, and a quick sensibility of decorum began to prevail over him. A neighboring physician was immediately sent for. He was one of those itinerant doctors who confound the last disorder they consulted upon with the present, and who follow a blind practice in a science for which the most mature investigation and justest observations do not preclude uncertainty and danger. He greatly increased the disorder by prescribing a fashionable nostrum. Can fashion extend to medicine? This frenzy was then all too prevalent in Paris. The grief of Mademoiselle St. Ives contributed still more than her physician to render her disorder fatal. Her body suffered martyrdom in the torments of her mind. The crowd of thoughts which agitated her breast communicated to her veins a more dangerous poison than the most burning fever. CHAPTER Twenty: THE DEATH OF THE BEAUTIFUL MADEMOISELLE ST. IVES AND ITS CONSEQUENCES 
Another physician was called in. This, instead of assisting nature, and leaving it to act in a young person whose organs recalled the vital stream, applied himself solely to counteract the effects of his brother's prescription. The disorder in two days became mortal. The brain, which is thought to be the seat of the mind, was as violently afflicted as the heart, which, we are told, is the seat of passion. By what incomprehensible mechanism are the organs in subjection to sentiment and thought? How is it that a single melancholy idea shall disturb the whole course of the blood, and that the blood should, in turn, communicate its irregularities to the human understanding? What is that unknown fluid which certainly exists, and quicker and more active than light, flies in less than the twinkling of an eye into all the channels of life, produces sensations, memory, joy or grief, reason or frenzy, recalls with horror what we would choose to forget, and renders a thinking animal either a subject of admiration or an object of pity and compassion. These were the reflections of the good old Gordon, and these observations, so natural, which men seldom make, did not prevent his feelings upon the occasion. He was not of the number of those gloomy philosophers who pique themselves upon being insensible. He was affected at the fate of this young woman, like a father who sees his dear child yielding to a slow death. The Abbe St. Ives was desperate the prior and his sister shed floods of tears. But who could describe the situation of her lover? All expression falls short of the summit of his affliction, and language here proves its imperfection. His aunt, almost lifeless, supported the head of the departing fair one in her feeble arms. Her brother was upon his knees at the foot of the bed. Her lover squeezed her hand, which he bathed in tears. His groans rent the air, whilst he called her his guardian angel, his life, his hope, his better half, his mistress, his wife. At the word wife, a sigh escaped her, whilst she looked upon him with inexpressible tenderness, and then abruptly gave a horrid scream. Presently, in one of those intervals when grief, the oppression of the senses and pain, subside, and leave the soul its liberty and powers, she cried out, I, your wife, ah, dear lover, this name, this happiness, this felicity, were not distant from me. I die and deserve it. O oh God, my heart, O oh, you whom I have sacrificed to infernal demons, it is done. I am punished. Live and be happy. These tender, dreadful expressions were incomprehensible, yet they melted and terrified every heart. She had the courage to explain herself, and her auditors quaked with astonishment, grief, and pity. They, with one voice, detested the man in power who repaired a shocking act of injustice only by his crimes, and who had forced the most amiable innocence to be his accomplice. Who? You guilty? said her lover. No, you are not. Guilt can only be in the heart. Yours is devoted solely to virtue and to me. This opinion he corroborated by such expressions as seemed to recall the beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives back to life. She felt some consolation from them, and was astonished at being still beloved. The aged Gordon would have condemned her at the time he was only a Jansenist, but having attained wisdom, he esteemed her and wept. In the midst of these lamentations and fears, whilst the dangerous situation of this worthy girl engrossed every breast, and all were in the greatest consternation, a courier arrived from court. A courier? From whom? And upon what account? He was sent by the king's confessor to the prior of the mountain. It was not Father de la Chaise who wrote, but Brother Vadbled, his valet de chambre, a man of great consequence at that time, who acquainted the archbishops with the Reverend Father's pleasure, who gave audience, promised benefices, and sometimes issued letters de cachet. He wrote to the Abbe of the Mountain that his reverence had been informed of his nephew's exploits, that his being sent to prison was thought a mistake, that such little disgraces frequently happened, and should therefore not be attended to. 
and in fine it behooved him, the prior, to come and present his nephew the next day, that he was to bring with him that good man Gordon, and that he, brother Van Bled, should introduce them to his reverence and Monsieur de Lavoie, who would say a word to them in his antechamber, to which he added that the history of the Huron and his combat against the English had been related to the king, that doubtless the king would deign to take notice of him in passing through the gallery, and perhaps might even nod his head to him. The letter concluded by flattering him with hopes that all the ladies of the court would show their eagerness to send for his nephew to their toilettes, and that several among them would say to him, Good day, Mr. Huron and that he was certainly to be talked of at the king's supper. The letter was signed, Your affectionate brother Jesuit, that bled. The prior, having read the letter aloud, his furious nephew for a moment suppressed his rage, and said nothing to the bearer, but turning towards the companion of his misfortunes, asked him what he thought of that style. Gordon replied, This, then, is the way that men are treated like monkeys they are first beaten, and then they dance. The Huron, resuming his character, which always returned in the great emotions of his soul, tore the letter to bits, and threw them in the courier's face. There is my answer, said he. His uncle in terrors, who fancied he saw thunderbolts and twenty letters de cachet at once fall upon him, immediately wrote, the best excuse he could for these transports of passion in a young man which he considered as ebullitions of a great soul. But a solicitude of a more melancholy stamp now seized every heart. The beautiful and unfortunate Mademoiselle St. Ives was already sensible of her approaching end. She was serene, but it was that kind of shocking serenity, the effect of exhausted nature, no longer able to withstand the conflict. Oh, my dear lover, said she in a faltering voice, death punishes me for my weakness, and I expire with the consolation of knowing you are free. I adore you whilst I betrayed you. I adore you in bidding you an eternal adieu. She did not make a parade of a ridiculous fortitude. She did not understand that miserable glory of having some of her neighbors say she died with courage. Who, at twenty, can be at once torn from her lover, from life, and from what is called honor, without regret, without some pangs? She felt all the horror of her situation, and made it felt by those expiring looks and words which speak with so much energy. In a word, she shed tears like other people at those intervals that she was capable of giving vent to them. Let others strive to celebrate the pompous deaths of those who insensibly rush into destruction. This is the lot of all animals. We die like them only when age or disorders make us resemble them by the stupidity of our organs. Whoever suffers a great loss, if they are stilted, it is nothing but vanity that is pursued, even in the arms of death. When the fatal moment came, all around her feelingly expressed their grief by incessant tears and lamentations. The Huron was senseless. Great souls fear more violently sensations than those of less tender dispositions. The good old Gordon knew enough of him to make him dread that when he came to himself he would be guilty of suicide. All kinds of arms were put out of his way, which the unfortunate young man perceived. He said to his relations and Gordon, without shedding any tears, without a groan, without the least emotion, Do you then think that any one upon earth hath right and power to prevent my putting an end to my life? Gordon took care to avoid making a parade of those commonplace declamations whereby it is endeavored to be proved that we are not allowed to exercise our liberty in ceasing to be when we are in a shocking situation, that we may not leave the house when we can no longer remain in it, that a man is on earth like a soldier at his post, as if it signified to the being of beings whether the conjunction of particles of matter 
were in one spot or another impotent reasons, to which a firm and contemplated despair disdains to listen, and to which Quito replied only with the use of a poignard. The Huron's sullen and dreadful silence, his doleful aspect, his trembling lips, and the shivering of his whole frame to every spectator's soul communicated that mixture of compassion and terror which fetters all its powers, precludes discourse, and is only uttered by faltering words. The hostess and her family came running. They trembled to behold the state of his desperation, yet all kept their eyes upon him and attended to all his motions. The ice-cold corpse of the beautiful Mademoiselle St. Ives had already been carried into the lower hall, out of the sight of her lover, who seemed still in search of it, though incapable of observing any object. In the midst of the spectacle of death, whilst the dead body was exposed at the door of the house, whilst two priests by the side of a holy water pot were repeating prayers with an air of distraction, whilst some passengers, through idleness, sprinkled the beer with some drops of holy water, and others went their ways quite indifferent, whilst her parents were drowned in tears, and every one thought the lover would not survive his loss. In this situation, Saint Poange arrived with his female Versailles friend. His transitory taste having been but once gratified, it became a fixed passion. A refusal of his generous gifts had piqued his pride. Father de la Chaise would never have suggested the thought of coming into this house, but Saint Paul Ange, having constantly before his eyes the image of the beautiful Mademoiselle Saint Ives, burning to satisfy a passion which, by a single enjoyment, had fixed in his heart the poignancy of desire, did not hesitate coming himself in search of her, whom he would not, perhaps, have been inclined to see a third time, had she come to him of her own accord. He alighted from his coach, and the first object that presented itself was a beer. He turned away his eyes, with that simple distaste of a man, bred up in pleasures, and who thinks he should avoid the spectacle which might recall him to the contemplation of human misery. He is inclined to go upstairs, whilst his female friend inquires, through curiosity, whose funeral it was. The name of Mademoiselle St. Ives is pronounced. At this name she turned and gave a shocking shriek. saint paul -Ange now returns, whilst surprise and grief possess his soul. The good old Gordon stood with streaming eyes. He for a moment ceased his lamentations to acquaint the courtier with all the circumstances of this melancholy catastrophe. He spoke with that authority which is the companion to sorrow and virtue. St. Paul Ange was not naturally wicked. The torrent of business and amusements had turned away his soul, which was not yet acquainted with itself. He did not border upon that gray age which usually hardens the hearts of ministers. He listened to Gordon with a downcast look, and some tears escaped him, which he was surprised to shed. In a word, he repented. I will, said he, absolutely see this extraordinary man you have mentioned to me. He affects me almost as much as this innocent victim whose death I have been the occasion of. Gordon followed him as far as the chamber, where were the prior, Kirkabon, the abbe, St. Ives, and some neighbors who were recalling to life the young man who had again fainted. I have been the cause of your misfortunes, said this deputy minister, and my whole life shall be employed in making reparation. The first idea that struck the Huron was to kill him, and then destroy himself. Nothing was more suitable to the circumstances. But he was without arms, and closely watched. St. Poange was now rebuked with refusals, accompanied with reproach, contempt, and the insults he deserved, which were lavished upon him. Time softens everything. M. de Lavoie at length succeeded in making an excellent officer of the Huron, who has appeared under another name at Paris, and in the army applauded by all honest men as being at once a warrior and an intrepid philosopher. 
he never mentioned his adventure without being greatly affected, and yet his greatest consolation was to speak of it. He cherished the memory of his beloved Mademoiselle St. Ives to the last moment of his life. The Abbey of St. Ives and the prior were each provided with good livings. The good Kirkabon rather chose to see his nephew invested with military honours than in a subdeaconry. The devotee of Versailles kept the diamond earrings, and received besides a handsome present. Father Tutatus had presents of chocolate, coffee, and confectionery, with the meditations of the Reverend Father Croisset in the flower of the saints bound in Morocco. Good old Gordon lived with the Huron till his death in the most friendly intimacy. He also had a benefice and forgot for ever effectual grace and the concomitant concourse. He took for his motto, Misfortunes are of some use. How many worthy people are there in the world who may justly say, Misfortunes are good for nothing? The end of the sincere Huron or La Ingenue by Voltaire. This reading by Roy Schreiber has been based upon the translation by Francis Ashmore.